go to knife now. They're opening. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. We're just uh, welcome to Douglas Week and this particular symposium. We're just giving it a few seconds here as our attendees join and our little counter, our little ticker is clicking up here. We're just going to give us another few seconds till everybody gets in. Give it another moment. We are still sort of attendees trickling in. Trickling. Um, the number's gone up anyway. That's that's the important thing. <laughs> yeah. We'll start, will we? We'll, um, oh. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Tim Groland, and I'm one of the organizers of Douglas Week 2021. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here with us to welcome you into this wide-ranging celebration of, uh, of the great abolitionist's visit to Ireland. Um, so, yeah, one and a half years ago, Douglas Week began as an idea for a small on-campus event, um, and it's changed and, and expanded pretty dramatically since then. Um, we now have an entirely online event that spans six different strands, which you can read more about it on our website. And this now goes far beyond uh, academia and has all kinds of interesting things like a, a sports strand and, and a musical evening. And we're really excited to be able to, to, to start um, to start today with this, what's going to be a fascinating discussion. Our aim is not only to celebrate Douglas uh, since he came to Ireland 176 years ago, but to emphasize the importance of remembering slavery and the intertwined struggles for liberation in Ireland and the United States. And we really have, I think, the right selection of panelists here to, to, to talk about that today. It's, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, a couple of housekeeping details. This event will last approximately three and a half hours. Uh, it's, it's a long one. <laughs> uh, please be respectful of our panelists. Conduct yourself online as you would in person. You'll find a Q&A box function at the bottom of the screen in which you can submit questions for our contributors. And our team will be monitoring these throughout the event uh, and, and passing them on. Um, and if you have any problems or any specific questions for our organizing team, you can email us directly at info at And, and uh, one of us will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, for your information, this event and all events throughout Douglas Week will be recorded and made available for viewing in the coming days. Um, and don't forget, as I said, that today's panel is only a small sample of what's available throughout the week. And you can check out our full program on our website, www.douglasincork.com, um, where there are also a number of unscheduled events and, and video projects and things like that for your viewing pleasure. We hope that you enjoy this uh, this event, and I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Adrian Mulligan, who's going to uh, talk you through the, the, what's a bit more about what's going to happen today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. Well, welcome everybody to one of the first um, events of this Douglas Week. Um, as Tim mentioned, my name is Adrian Mulligan. I'm a member of a small team of uh, UCC scholars who have organised this project, uh, namely Dr. Caroline Schroeder especially who's been one of the main dynamos of his projects, uh, Sarah McCready, Dr. Tim Groenland right here, uh, Christian Leary, Dr. Donald Hassett and Daniel O'Connell, um, who I'd like to take this opportunity to thank for all their hard work. 
Although I'm not a UCC scholar myself, I'm a scholar with Frederick Douglass uh, in Ireland, and I did earn my master's degree in geography from UCC uh, many moons ago. And I also have family in Cork, and uh, I, I return quite often. So what is this Douglas Week all about? In a nutshell, we're trying to remember um, something and recover something extraordinary that happened 175 years ago. Extraordinary maybe only insofar as how much we have forgotten about ourselves because it wasn't that extraordinary at the time. This is a week organized around remembering the visit to Ireland of the American abolitionist and former slave Frederick Douglass, who toured this realm of what was then the United Kingdom between 1845 and 1846. At the time, Ireland had some very strong and vocal abolitionist organizations who protested racism and the fact that so many people around the world were still enslaved as a result of their skin color, for example, in the United States. Frederick Douglass was not the first American abolitionist to visit Ireland, and nor was he the last, but he was arguably the most famous. However, it is worth pointing out that he was not yet that famous when he visited these shores at the age of just 27, uh, and remarkably as somebody who had been himself a slave just a few years previous. Ireland and the Irish fight for freedom from colonialism had loomed large in Douglass's consciousness long before he arrived on Irish shores. He had learned to read and write as a slave, devouring scraps of Sheridan, Grattan, and O'Connell under the kitchen table of his master, admiring their speaking of liberty and calling for an end to slavery. It was Irish sa sailors on the shores of Eastern Maryland who first told him as a young boy that he should flee north. And on the docks of Baltimore many years later, Douglas would speak again of Irish dock workers, telling him to flee. Flee he did, and having made somewhat of a name for himself as an up-and-coming abolitionist in Massachusetts, Douglas would attend um, the inspirational reading of the Great Irish Address uh, at Faneuil Hall, um, in which the liberated Daniel O'Connell and tens of thousands of Irish signatories urged Irish Americans to also endorse the cause of abolitionism. In Ireland, Douglas was welcomed by all and sundry, uh, not just by abolitionist societies, which were then dominated by both Irish, of Protestant and Quaker faith, but also by Catholics, with Douglas crossing the sectarian realm that existed back then to speak to the latter, primarily at temperance rallies, where he preached the benefits of teetotalism and abolitionism together. While Douglas sympathized with the plight of Irish Catholics and would later write more openly of some horrific scenes of destitution that he witnessed in both urban and rural areas on the eve of the Great Famine, he nonetheless remained steadfastly committed to the cause of abolitionism, to freeing the millions of his brothers and sisters held in bondage. He would agree that, that therefore that while Irish Catholics suffered terribly, he would nonetheless point out that they were at least free, and this was a crucial distinction. Although he saw the folly in comparing injustices and how that helped nobody but the oppressors. On the streets of cities like Cork, Douglas, a black asylum seeker one must remember, would constantly remark that he experienced no racism for the first time in his life, and that the Irish people were the first to treat him as a man rather than as a thing or as an animal. This was something he mused might be the product of the Irish, despite being white people, being themselves subject to colonialism, something that perhaps made them different from white people in America. The fact that Douglas could walk the streets of Irish cities and not experience racism would have a profound effect on Douglas, and combined with the Irish publishers who printed his book and the journalists who broadcast his speeches, uh, by a newspaper around the world for the rest of his life, he would say that it was the Irish um, and Ireland who meant the world to him. So our symposium today, therefore, considers, his, considers Douglas's tour of what was then the United Kingdom and of Great Britain and Ireland. And we have speakers considering the manner in which he engaged with a range of different local contexts, illuminating the abolitionists in these contexts that facilitated his voice. Furthermore, we consider Douglas's wife and children who also facilitated his travels uh, throughout Ireland. Our speakers consider Douglas's tour too within a much broader transatlantic and perhaps even global context and his engagement with the Irish around the world over the course of Douglas's long life. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker today in this particular symposium, um, namely Patricia Ferreira. Um, Dr. Ferreira, is a professor at Norwich University. She's the author of Frederick Douglass in Ireland, amongst many other things, in addition to a range of other publications. Most recently, um, she has a biography of Isabel Jennings, who served as the secretary of the Cork Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, 
And her talk today is titled Beyond Vinegar, Soda Water and Lemonade, Abolitionism and the Jennings Family. So welcome, Patty. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Adrian, to be a presenter today. Um, I am going to share my screen and I'm basically going to um, give you some background on Isabel Jennings uh, that led to her being Ireland's most prominent female abolitionist. Um, this presentation is part of a much longer biography, as Adrian said, on um, Isabel Jennings that I've been working on for some time. So let me um, get my slides to you. Can everybody see those? Not yet. Oh, okay. Oh yes, we can. We can. Okay, so I've, I've got multiple monitors open here. So okay. that's my bad. <laughs> All right. So as I said, I'm going to give you some background on Isabel Jennings that led to her being um, uh, Ireland's most prominent uh, female abolitionist. Um, <clears throat> so Isabel Jennings, her last known residence, uh, well, was at a Wellesley Terrace off Cork Southern Road. She is buried in St. Finbar Cemetery, located in the older section. The stone marking her grave is unique because of its simplicity. The plain cement oblong stands about six feet, only arcing in a gentle curve at the top. The unembellished marker also belies the fact that Isabel achieved international distinction as an Irish female abolitionist. And although her dedication to the anti-slavery crusade is often linked to her relationship with Frederick Douglass, a fuller sense of her background importantly yields that Jennings' involvement in the abolition movement has more to do with her family rather than being solely the result of her connections with Douglass and prominent British activists. Oops, go back. By the end of the 18th century, Jennings's father's vinegar and soda water initiatives proved so successful that he was able to build a manufactory that eventually sprawled the entire length of both sides of Brown Street. Known as Browna by locals, the area bustled with legions employed by the Jennings Company, which remained its hallmark for generations. Isabel and her brothers and sisters grew up alongside the business, the family residence occupying the northeast corner where Brown met Paul Street. There they hosted Frederick Douglass when he arrived in Cork in the latter part of 1845. As Isabel helped organize Douglass's speaking engagements and facilitated meetings for him, their friendship grew. Even though Douglas's visit certainly galvanized Jennings' anti-slavery ambitions, she had already proved herself well before his arrival to be an ardent member of the cause in its most progressive manifestations. By the time of his arrival in Cork, she was 36, mature enough to have been influenced by earlier forces that caused her to be well disposed to the anti-slavery agenda particularly because she and her siblings domestic milieu that championed profound social reform. Key to charting Isabel's path to the anti-slavery mission was her family's membership in the liberal Unitarian church located on Princes Street. Though the congregation was relatively small, it had an unmatched influence on the charities educational institutions and the politics of the city. Pastor Thomas Dix Hinks also prompted his fellow followers to tend to the social needs of the city that nourished alliances across religious divides. Acting on Hinks's preaching, Jennings's father sought to provide greater public access to potable water Although his efforts could be construed as entirely self-serving because of his advocacy, the number of public fountains that were available 
24 hours, seven days a week, increased from three to 100 across the municipality. He combined his own industrial demands with the welfare of the larger community, which was a cornerstone of Hinks's vision. Tellingly, two of Hinks's children, William and Hannah, were contemporaries and lifelong friends of Isabel, and like her became involved in Ireland's abolitionist campaign, demonstrating the way the cause was a pressing part of the Prince's Street fold. William was a notable writer for the anti-slavery standard and Hannah became secretary of the Belfast Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, just as Isabel functioned in a similar role for the Cork group. In 1825, a setback occurred in the Jennings family when Thomas Sr. died. Her brother, Thomas Jr., at 25, became the head of the household, responsible for its welfare and also that of their business. Like his father before him, Thomas Jr. also found his social footing by continuing his commitment to his community. He became a frequent critic of a bureaucracy which he felt did more to subjugate than it did to govern, a police force which he felt used excessive force, and a social welfare effort which he felt fell well short of caring for the city's hungry and homeless. Jennings's willingness to speak in the face of injustice was certainly a trait that extended to his younger siblings. Eventually, Isabel openly disapproved of restrictions voiced by abolitionist leadership that limited the political involvement of women. And she drew heat from her fellow abolitionists, both in Ireland and Britain, when she believed they were attempting to restrain African Americans, including Douglas, from determining their own destiny. Regardless of the disfavor that was directed toward her, she persisted in supporting ambitions Blacks sought for themselves. One of the Jennings's family's passions was improving formal education in Cork in ways that would have practical benefits for the agrarian nature of most Irish households. Again, Reverend Hinks proved a catalyst when he envisioned the way agricultural and industrial development bolstered by science could improve society. To realize his thinking, he played a strong hand in founding the Royal Cork Institution, which gave rise to and com complemented the more amateur associations in which Isabel's brothers, Thomas Jr., Francis, and Robert all held leadership responsibilities. The Jenningses also used their political clout to campaign and provide land for the establishment of both Queens College, which eventually became University College Cork, and the Munster Agricultural School and Model Farm. Isabel's own correspondence to her abolition associates certainly demonstrates that she was brought up in an environment that offered a rich intellectual and social reach. Her family's personal affiliation with the various educational institutions and organizations functioning in the city explains how Jennings's outlooks became as informed as they were. Likewise, because the Cork anti-slavery late because the Cork Ladies Anti-Slavery Society's membership exhibited a diverse cross-section of women and some men it seems she too generally upheld egalitarian principles in its operations, believing everyone's input and involvement would eventually result in a quicker end to slavery. Even when the famine threatened the amount of attention the members could devote to abolition and also diminish their ability to contribute to fundraising initiatives, she accepted any donation, regardless how modest, expressing her contention that any support was valuable and at the least continued to foster engagement in the cause. When tracing the origins of Isabel's anti-slavery advocacy, it is important to realize that industry on the whole was believed related to large scale social improvement. The Jennings's business certainly played into such an ethos 
Isabel's brother Francis was especially ardent that the company promote self-sustaining economic and employment security. Their large selection of car carbonated beverages, vinegars, as well as a non-intoxicating winter stout also implicated the Jenningses in the temperance movement, which was closely allied with abolition. Though Isabel sometimes expressed a more liberal disposition toward alcohol, especially when used as a then thought of medicinal, she and her sisters attended temperance meetings and functions when Douglas arrived. They helped organize a soiree for him at the Temperance Institute only blocks away from Brown Street. While the Jennings business grew, the Cork Anti-Slavery Society was formed in 1826, and its membership was also comprised of those related to the Jenningses. Namely, John Topp, the father-in-law of Isabel's oldest sister, served as its co-secretary. The direct familial link to the Cork Anti-Slavery Society also explains how Isabel's relationship with Billy Martin a prominent member of the local Quaker community unfolded. He is thought to have instigated Father Theobald Matthews' temperance agenda and also was the city's representative to the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. When Jennings established the Cork Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, Martin functioned as a signatory on some of the reports and solicitations she published on behalf of the group. With her family's longstanding considerable philanthropic endeavors and accomplishments, their associations with other prominent Cork humanitarians, as well as their own connections to the city's abolition origins, it is no wonder that Jennings would emerge as an enduring Irish voice in the campaign. Thank you. Well, that is wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ferreira. Um, if you know that part of the world, I think it's Paul Street Shopping Center, but there's a yeah. Tesco there yeah. um, in Cork. Um, and we've been trying to figure out, um, myself and Lawrence Fenton, might have to talk to you, Patty, about this, uh, whether the Jennings' house perhaps still survives, even though um, the rest of the factory is, was taken over by a Tesco. So, um, but no, that was, that was wonderful. Um, we, we, have, so we don't have any questions coming in yet. So I would encourage um, folks who are, who are watching this, if you have any questions um, for Dr. Ferreira or you know, in combination with, with the rest of us, if, if things come to mind, please do uh, use the, the, the Q&A here. Um, I've been taking notes as I did just there on <laughs> Dr. Ferreira's um, talk, but you don't need to hear me asking more questions necessarily. We would love to have some questions coming in through the Q&A, um, but there's also gonna be some time as well here. Um, um, I think we've got another one, another two. So yeah, we've, we've got two more presenters and then we'll have a, a little sort of specific 15 minutes for discussion followed by a little uh, intermission. So there's, there's gonna be time built in uh, during all of this. Um, for us to sort of take time for, for some discussion, some Q&A, and, you know, hopefully too, um, some of our other panelists as well can, can wade in here too with some of these, these, these questions for, for the other panelists. Okay, I'm going to keep going here and try to keep things on, on vague schedule. Um, our next presenter, unfortunately, um, could not be here in person uh, today. Um, she is uh, currently teaching uh, classes at Temple University in, uh, in Philadelphia. Um, so our next presenter um, is Dr. Anna Dolo Okur. Um, she's a professor of African-American studies um, at Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, she's the author of Dismantling Slavery, Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and the Formation of the Abolition abolitionist discourse 1841 to 1851. Um, she unfortunately couldn't be here today but we do have a pre-recorded talk with 
which um, fingers crossed, I'll be able to press play on here in a second. Um, her talk is titled Frederick Douglass's Transatlantic Journeys. So I'm gonna share this now with a bit of luck and hopefully um, we'll be able to see Dr. Okur's um, uh, contribution to today's symposium. And again, feel free to, to enter some questions here. I think Dr. Okur might be popping in later on. Um, if not, we can pass those questions on to her and she might be able to get back to you. So there's all sorts of things here that we can, we can do with this. Okay. I talk to myself, I do so much Zooming these days, and I always talk to myself when I'm, when I'm doing technological things. So let's see, um, let's make sure I'm sharing my sounds and everything else. Okay, we do this. Hello, my name is Negun Anadolu Okut. I'm a Temple University professor. I'm also a Frederick Douglass scholar. I'm very happy to be part of this conference. And I say thank you the organizers and Adrian uh, for helping me uh, be able to present this to you, although I cannot be with you. I have a PowerPoint that I want to share with you, but before that, I want to share that we have a conference coming up and it is 18th annual Underground Railroad Conference. This year, we are going to talk about the black troops. So I hope you can join us. Uh, if you send me an email, I will send you the program. This is a virtual conference on February 17th. We will be happy to have you. It is free and open to all. This is something we do at Temple University for almost 18 years. Uh, this is what we are going to celebrate this year. Um, I also want to have uh, another PowerPoint that I want to share with you. And it is um, right here. I'm not sure if you can see it. I hope you can. Uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, Transatlantic Journey and His Irish Friends is, of course, very interesting topic. And I wanted to speak about this in detail, but uh, my time is limited. So I will just skip over some pages and want to share this with you. Uh, Frederick Douglass's wonderful friend, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, worked with him on abolition of slavery, both on both sides of the Atlantic, both here in the US and also in Europe, particularly in Ireland and in Britain. So Douglass's trip was of course the outcome of this friendship and uh, this is how we reach to so many documents about Douglas and Daniel O'Connell, whom you know very well, the activist leader and the hero that Frederick Douglass admired so much. I'm wondering if you can still see what's going on here with my slides. If not, I'm gonna share it with you one more time from the beginning. I hope it is okay. And uh, as I said, uh, Douglas admired Daniel O'Connell because of his bravery, his courage, and the way he uh, spoke to the crowds. Uh, Douglas compared to Daniel O'Connell was quite young and I believe he learned many of these speech tactics from listening to Daniel O'Connell only after he arrived in Ireland, but before that he was reading Daniel O'Connell's uh, essays that he sent to Liberator, which William Lloyd Garrison published with pleasure. Douglas's self-education is important to mention because Many people were questioning who he is, and that is one of the reasons why he left US so suddenly. In 1845, it had become very dangerous for him because he had published his first narrative and people were questioning how a slave can be so eloquent in speech and is this really a former slave? So when his identity was revealed because of the narrative becoming uh, published, he had to run away. On this trip, uh, there were a few people, some of his friends accompanying him. This is the Hutchinson family, the famous musical group that accompanied him in addition to John, uh, John Botham. 
So in the summer of 1845, um, he leaves and uh, because of his autobiography, at least that is uh, the most important reason that we know. Uh, he published his book also in uh, Dublin by Richard Bebb and the Quaker printer was very much in support of American anti-slavery movement. So they became good friends. Uh, we know that he traveled on board the Cambria, one of the most important and established Cunard Line transatlantic steamships. Uh, there were several incidents that took place uh, on the ship, but this was a beautiful ship and it was really built in Scotland in 1844. So almost uh, a brand new ship uh, belonged to Cunard Line. Uh, it was 219 feet long. It was a wooden paddle steamer and it would complete the transatlantic journey in two weeks. Uh, it had room for 120 people, but of course we should not imagine that it was not a luxury liner. There was so much space allocated to the engines and the coal that passengers comfort was only secondary. Uh, Douglas had a first class ticket. He boarded the ship, but his cabin was far from being a first class uh, uh, cabin. Uh, he was accompanied, as I said, with Hutchinson's. They were very much friendly, not only with Douglas, but with the ship's cap captain, Charles Judkins. And they convinced him that Douglas should be allowed to be on the promenade deck each morning so he could have some sea breeze. Among the passengers were doctors, lawyers, soldiers, and sailors, as well as Catholic bishops, Quakers, and government officials from Canada, as well as slaveholders from Cuba and Georgia. Uh, Douglas wrote, and I will not read all of it, but she, he said, I shall never forget the thrill of pleasure and excitement, the eager rush of passengers from cabin to deck when it was announced by some keen-eyed mariner that the shores of Ireland were in sight. This was August 26. He recollected his voyage as a very pleasant one. Uh, and he called Ireland, as he wrote, the Emerald Isle. Um, Captain Judkins uh, was able to prevent a big argument on behalf of Frederick Douglass, although some sources uh, claim that he was not that friendly. Uh, there were some pejorative terms associated with Douglas and he was yelled at, but there was another man, an uh, Irish soldier, Captain Thomas Goo, uh, who wanted to defend Douglas and he was ready to fight for him, which is another pleasant incident. So the Cambria reaches the, uh, port that was in his destination uh, in Liverpool on the morning of Thursday, 28 August. And then uh, Douglas doesn't get off because they have to go to Dublin. So they continue on the trip uh, with his friend Buffum. Uh, Richard Webb became an important uh, liaison for him in Dublin. As I mentioned, he was the one who published, uh, published um, Douglas's narrative also in Dublin. Uh, I included Ramon's picture here because he was very famous and he was very popular because uh, before Douglas came onto lecture circuit. Uh, but here is something that is another uh, common point between American abolitionists and Irish abolitionists, and that is because the uh, British and Irish uh, abolitionists uh, contributed to the annual Boston Bazaar, which took place every Christmas. They would collect and make, create purses, bags, cushions, scarves in order to be shipped to the US, especially to Boston, so that they could be sold and the income uh, raised from these funds would be helping the people who were escaping from the South to the North to resettle. Uh, this is the book I wanted to mention. Richard Davis Webb published The Life and Letters of Captain John Brown, in addition to Douglas's narrative in Dublin. So you can always remember him as the friend of the uh, former slaves. 
And Charles Lennox Raymond from Philadelphia was a great speaker and abolitionist uh, at the same time, very famous. I was curious to find out what this little town of Cork was, and I found these quaint pictures. Unfortunately, it was the time of the Great Famine, and these two illustrations contrast uh, what had happened in this tiny little town, which Douglas was very much fond of, before and after the famine, which was the most unlucky time in human history, 1845. Uh, I would like to end uh, my slideshow, but here is something that I want to share with you. And I hope you are able to see this. Uh, our conference will take place on February 17th. Uh, please join us. Uh, just send me an email at A-N-A-D-O-L-U. And I will be very happy to share this link with you. Uh, and we need more audiences and you are very welcome. I thank you for this opportunity. This ends my presentation. Uh, hope I will be able to join you in future, maybe for longer periods of time. Let's continue the friendship and exchange. Have a beautiful week and congratulations to the organizing committee. Bye. All right, we're back. Um, I'd like just to thank, um, even though she unfortunately could not be here, uh, nonetheless, obviously thank uh, Dr. Nilgun Anadolu Okur um, at Temple University for that wonderful um, presentation of, of um, Frederick Douglass and think about his transatlantic voyages and his trip to Cork and also that conference that's coming up there on um, African-American soldiers who served in the Civil War too, um, which, looks, which looks really interesting. Um, one nice thing about Zoom, obviously, um, and, and heaven help us this pandemic, is we're able to sort of attend these things, uh, you know, remotely and virtually um, in ways maybe that we couldn't do uh, previously. So um, one little uh, bright uh, thing to think about. Okay, so we are going to move on um, here. Again, keep on sort of um, sending the questions into the Q&A. We have folks behind the scenes here who are monitoring this stuff. I'm looking at the Q&A, so if you've typed questions in, don't worry, we, we're not ignoring you. Um, I think what we're going to do after um, Dr. Um, Pettinger, who's going to go next here, um, has presented his talk. Um, we'll have Dr. Pettinger and Dr. Ferreira um, and myself and we can go through some of those uh, Q&A um, and, and try to sort of collate some of those and, and talk a little bit before we keep on rolling um, with our symposium today. Um, interestingly there too, um, as well, super quick, um, Dr. Anadolu Okura mentioned Charles Lennox Remond, um, another um, important abolitionist, somebody who I'm sure uh, will, will pop up later on here in our symposium today. Um, if, if my memory serves me right, he actually, I think, delivered the great Irish address from Daniel O'Connell um, to uh, Faneuil Hall, um, and that was the address that, that called on um, Irish Americans to endorse the cause of abolitionism um, in the United States, and that, that, that's another story um, in a slightly different context, and again, something we'll, we'll come back to um, here uh, today. Okay, so without further ado here, I'm going to keep on rolling um, according to our schedule. And again, keep on sending in these Q&As. Um, uh, if you have any questions there for uh, Professor Okur, although she's not here, um, we can also send those things on to her. We can, we can try to sort of ascertain some, some answers for you as well, perhaps. Um, our next uh, speaker um, this morning um, or this afternoon, depending upon where you are in the world, is Dr. Alistair Pettinger. Um, Dr. Pet Pettinger is an independent scholar. Um, amongst his many publications, he edited Always Elsewhere, Travels of the Black Atlantic, and is most recently the co-editor of Frederick Douglass and Scotland, 1846, Living an Anti-Slavery Life. So again, here, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Alistair uh, Pettinger to our symposium. And I hope that you uh, enjoy his, his talk today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Adrian. Uh, I'm just going to share a screen, hopefully. Um, yes, I was, uh, I've been thinking about um, how any touring performers really connect with their audiences uh, by declaring some kind of affiliation to the places that they visit. And uh, in Frederick Douglass's case, he usually did this by demonstrating his knowledge of figures of local or national importance whom he had reason to admire. And today I'm just going to be looking at some examples from his speaking engagements uh, in Ireland and Scotland in 1845 to 6. Um, as we've heard um, in his narrative, uh, Douglas wrote of the importance to him as a young man of reading the Colum Columbian Orator, uh, a widely reprinted primer in the arts of eloquence, <coughs> singling out two texts in particular, including one of Sheridan's mighty speeches on and behalf of Catholic emancipation. Uh, as it happens, uh, he confused him with Arthur O'Connor, who is correctly identified as the author of the speech by the editor of the orator, uh, Caleb Bingham. Uh, but as far as I know, he, definitely, he never made anything of this in his lectures in Ireland. But he did take care on at least two occasions that we've also heard um, when giving an account of the disturbances on the outward voyage from Boston, he let audiences know that one of those who defended him against the physical threats of the pro-slavery passenger was a noble-hearted Irishman, a Mr. Goth, who told the reckless trafficker in human flesh and bones that two could play at that work. Uh, and this was Captain Thomas Bunbury Goff, who was returning home on leave from his infantry regiment in Canada. And that's actually a memorial to him in St. Columb's Cathedral in Derry, uh, commemorating his death in battle in the Crimea 10 years later. But much more important were Douglas's expressions of praise for the liberator, Daniel O'Connell. Within a month of his arrival in D Dublin, he had seen the elderly politician speak at the repeal movement's new headquarters, Conciliation Hall. In the account Douglas sends Garrison of the occasion dwells on the impact of his oratory. I've never heard one by whom I was more completely captivated than by Mr. O'Connell, he writes. So if one Irishman, O'Connor, gave him his first lessons in public speaking on the printed page, another, O'Connell, followed it with a practical demonstration from the lecture platform. But it's O'Connell's bold stance against slavery that animates most of Douglas's invocations in his subsequent speeches. So in Cork, for example, he says, I feel grateful to him for his voice has made American slavery shake to its center. I'm determined wherever I go and whatever position I may fill to speak with grateful emotions of Mr. O'Connell's labors. And indeed he honored his pledge, continuing to praise the man and invite others to follow his example throughout the rest of his tour uh, in, in England as well. But still, despite his immense popularity, O'Connell was a co controversial figure. And if Douglas was happy to praise his abolitionism, he tends to avoid directly endorsing his stance on repeal. Even at Conciliation Hall, he realizes he would not be expected to speak of repeal as a political question. And if he goes on to break his own rule, he takes care to avoid doing so in his own name. The spirit that animated those whom he then addressed had a kindred spirit in America and thousands there who hated slavery were devoted to the cause of Ireland. They said that they would be repealers if they were in Ireland. And his host in Dublin, Richard Webb, who didn't support a repeal may have advised him to steer clear of the matter in any case. Uh, but even as an abolitionist, O'Connell's reputation was not unsullied. Garrison thought that his steadfast support of anti-slavery wavered in the face of the levels of support for repeal among the pro-slavery like Irish in the United States. And it was actually only under pressure from William Horton um, of the Hibernian Slavery Society that O'Connell took the stand against their blood-stained donations. And there is little evidence that he afterwards returned the monies that he received. 
So if Douglas held firm to an anti-slavery O'Connell well after his departure from Ireland, he must have found his public affiliation with the Liberator awkward, requiring some tact, given that not all those who were warm to his abolitionist message shared Douglas's enthusiasm for the man. Now in Cork, he paused in a lecture to remark, I cannot proceed without alluding to the man who did much to abolish slavery. I mean, Daniel O'Connell. And then a few months later in air, needing a Scottish hero to draw to his side, Douglas, as it were, rewinds the tape and begins again, this time choosing someone more locally connected and using an almost identical formulation, allowing for the shift to indirect speech in the newspaper report. He declares that he was proud of having been in the land of him who had spoken out so nobly against the oppressions and wrongs of slavery. He alluded, of course, to Robert Burns. Now, in both cases, the attribution of abolitionist sympathies is extravagant, given that the priorities of O'Connell and Burns lay elsewhere. But Burns, as well as being conveniently dead, was venerated more universally by his compatriots than O'Connell. If political divisions in Ireland were expressed as for and against O'Connell, in Scotland, by contrast, everyone claimed Burns. They just adapted him to suit their various and often opposed purposes. So there was a Tory Burns and a Whig Burns and a Chartist Burns and so on. Now, last summer, we were forcefully reminded not just of the contentious nature of statues, but also the politics of naming, uh, not least here in Glasgow, where I am, where the street signs themselves have become sites of anti-racist intervention. So it's perhaps a special interest now that Douglas didn't just invoke the names of Irishmen and Scotsmen he admired, he understood how they could be used to rename himself. Young Frederick changed his name several times. Born Bailey, he adopted the name Stanley and Johnson while on the run from Baltimore to New Bedford, where he settled on Douglas. But um, as an emerging public figure, he was also bestowed the names with the names of more celebrated individuals with whom he was compared. And he was not alone. And among his African-American contemporaries who also toured Europe, the actor Mary Webb, for example, was known as the Coloured Siddons, after the better known white performer, Sarah Siddons. The singer Elizabeth Greenfield uh, was dubbed the Black Swan uh, in a revision of Ginny Lynn's nickname, the Swedish Nightingale. And Douglas himself didn't escape this treatment. The man who had welcomed into Dundee, George Gilfillan, later referred to him as the Burns of the African race. But this was not the only time his name became ent entangled with the name of another. And I want to say something about how he manipulated this convention to serve his own purposes. At a public meeting in Glasgow in 1835, O'Connell famously expressed to great cheers the hope that one day some black O'Connell might rise amongst his fellow slaves who would cry, agitate, agitate, agitate. When invited by O'Connell to address the audience at Conciliation Hall, Douglas suggests that his words travelled far and wide. The poor trampled slave of Carolina had heard the name of the Liberator with joy and hope, and he himself had heard the wish that some black O'Connell would yet rise up amongst his countrymen and cry, agitate, agitate, agitate. And recalling the occasion many years later, Douglas claimed that at the meeting, O'Connell playfully called me the Black O'Connell of the United States. And whether this is true or not, Douglas did nothing at the time to challenge the implication that he was the imagined kin that O'Connell had wished for. Now Douglas, O'Connell and their audiences would have known the oft-told story of how during the revolution in colonial Saint-Domingue, the French General Laveau claimed that the rebel commander Toussaint Louverture was the black Spartacus predicted by the Enlightenment philosopher, philosopher Abbé Reynal. And in her historical romance, The Hour and the Man, 
Harriet Martineau speculated that Toussaint heard these words and in his heart also they were glowing. But there's no evidence that he adopted the designation himself. Another example equally familiar to contemporaries was the tragedian Ira Aldridge. The London Times had dubbed him sarcastically the African Roscius after the Roman actor Quintus Roscius Gallus. But to, uh, Aldridge, in contrast to Toussaint, turned the nickname to his advantage and used it to advertise his shows and even spun an increasingly elaborate and fictitious biography to suit. So Douglas was happy to remind his audience at Conciliation Hall of O'Connell's famous invocation of a hypothetical black counterpart. But to call himself the black O'Connell, however playfully, would have trapped him within the terms of a contemporary whose agenda he must have realized was not always congruent with his own. Spartacus and Roscius, on the other hand, were classical models polished by the centuries in a way that the contentious Irish leader was not. And Douglas had already been compared to Spartacus in a newspaper report of one of his earliest speeches in Massachusetts. The writer reminded of Edwin Forrest's performance in Robert Montgomery Byrd's drama, The Gladiator of 1831, premiered in New York in the wake of Nat Turner's slave insurrection in Virginia. Uh, and in a similar uh, gesture, uh, an English newspaper report referred to Douglas as the Negro Hercules. Now, the example of Aldridge, who was touring the west of Scotland when Douglas arrived in Glasgow in 1846, although there's no record of them meeting, may have alerted him to the possibilities of appropriating for himself a name like Roscius, bestowed by another. But Douglas already bore the name of an ancient forebear. He didn't have to wait for a theater critic or a political leader to bestow one on him with kind intentions or not. Nathan Johnson in New Bedford had already encouraged him to adopt the resident patronymic Douglas after the hero of Walter Scott's poem, Lady of the Lake, several years before he took to the public stage. And later he would be pleased to discover that he shared the name with another James Douglas, the legendary commander who fought alongside Bruce at Bannockburn, popularly known as the Black Douglas. In Scotland, the briefest re reference and, and a metaphorical wink was all Frederick needed to exploit his own name before audiences, long spellbound by the heroic deeds it conjured up, absorbing the literary prestige it had accumulated in the work of Burns and Scott. And from his hotel in Perth in January 1846, he composed a response to the public ac accusation made by a Marylander that his narrative was a catalogue of lies and that the Frederick Bailey he had known as a boy could not possibly have been its author. And Douglas included this response, much revised, in the second Dublin edition of his narrative and he reworked several passages from it in speeches he made in Scotland in the weeks and months that followed. So he's addressing uh, this um, former acquaintance of childhood in, uh, in Maryland. The change in me is truly amazing. If you should meet me now, you would scarcely know me. I once hardly dared look up at you. If I should meet you now where, I, if I should meet you where I now am, amid the free hills of old Scotland, where the ancient Black Douglas once met his foes, I presume I might summon sufficient fortitude to look you full in the face. It may be that wearing the brave name which I have assumed might lead me to deeds which would render our meeting not the most agreeable. Especially might this be the case if you should attempt to enslave me. You would see a wonderful difference in me. So no wonder perhaps that it was as a black Douglas and not a black O'Connell that he declares his freedom and independence. So thank you. I'm very grateful to Adrian uh, for offering me the opportunity to speak here today alongside such distinguished scholars and to all the organizers who've uh, made this special week of uh, celebration possible. Um, if you'd like to know more about Douglas in Scotland, 
uh, do please check out my book uh, and also my website, which includes transcriptions of newspaper reports of all the speeches he made there in 1846, uh, which is supported by a Twitter account, which tries to keep up with the emerging research and related activities. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Alastair, for that really intriguing. I know I have some questions. I was making some notes there as, as you were talking. So we have a little bit of time here for some questions um, until, let's see, until uh, around about 10 after four, um, Irish and, and, and British time. Um, I'm in the United States here, it's still morning for me. Um, so yeah, we have approximately 15 minutes here when myself and Dr. Pettinger and hopefully Dr. Ferreira um, can entertain some of these questions that have come in so far. If we have some questions um, for other panelists that we have too, we can always hopefully um, bring them into the mix too. And our Q&A here, I'm just, I've just pulled up our Q&A. Uh, some of these questions are, have already been sort of answered in the Q&A um, by our panelists as we go along. But nonetheless, it's, it's obviously nice if we can possibly share these um, to, to everybody. So let's see, let, I'm starting here right at the beginning with some of these questions. There's a question here that came in um, to Dr. Patricia uh, Ferreira. Um, asking what cemetery um, Isabel Jennings is, is buried in, um, in Cork. Um, I'm wondering since, since we have um, Patricia Ferreira, Ferreira here, rather than me sort of talk about how she's answered these, these, these questions, we can, we can let her uh, talk here a little bit. Um, so Dr. Uh, Ferreira here, um, yeah. can you just maybe talk a little bit more about where, um, she is buried where Isabel Jennings is, is, is buried in Cork. And also too, I can sort of follow up here with this conversation with some more questions that, that came in as you, as you do that. Okay, so she is buried in St. Finbar's um, on the Glashing Road in Cork. And uh, she's in the old part of the cemetery. It's a family plot um, that has her brother and older sister um, and two younger sisters also there so that's where it is um very yeah. good. <laughs> good um this is the thing is is we're all douglas scholars here but it, it's and you'll see this during the week so much of this abolitionist history and um douglas's travels all of his stuff is still in cork it's still all there um, just waiting to be sort of discovered. Um, and this, this history obviously is, is as you realize this week, is a really powerful history, a history that we need now, sort of thinking about racism um, in modern Irish society, the fact that we have this, this anti-racist movement historically that we maybe don't know as much about as we, as we could know, and that could be an awful lot of use to us right now to, to recover, not just historically, but the fact that we, I'm a geographer, um, the fact that we actually have the, physical <laughs> evidence of it in, uh, in, in, in the cemetery, for example, or in buildings all over Cork and many other cities um, in Ireland and Scotland and the United Kingdom. Um, a lot of this um, history and geography still survives in, in the landscape. So um, another question here that came in for you, um, Paddy, is um, asking for more information about one of the last of your slides. I think it was a watercolor. Right. Um, that, that, that you had. So these were, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the ladies anti-slavery societies across the United States um, and Europe, uh, particularly in Ireland, Scotland and England, they would, um, the Boston group under uh, Maria Chapman's direction uh, had these fairs that were, especially at Christmas time, they were the things to go to. And um, Irish, uh, especially when, when things were sold at the Boston um, Fair uh, from Europe, um, whether it be from Ireland, Scotland, or England, um, you know, uh, they, they got a better price for them. You know, there was that uh, American thing with uh, fascination with things coming from um, abroad being uh, more, um, more expensive and, and more desirable. And so a, a lot of the uh, ladies anti-slavery societies worked for the entire year to 
um, make things to sell at the fair. And um, that just happens to be one of those uh, items. And, uh, you know, I can't impress upon the audience uh, too much how important these fairs were. They were the primary source of income for the uh, American uh, abolitionist movement and um, the one in Boston. I mean, eventually um, all of the various ladies anti-slavery societies would run a fair in their own locales, but the Boston fair was the biggest and it, um, and, and people would wait uh, all year to go to it. And, um, and so, uh, when you, uh, so, and, and when you went, you also, uh, told everybody that you were at it. Um, and so, uh, like I said, it was the primary source of income for the, uh, for the anti-slavery movement in the United States. And, uh, and they just were very popular and, and, uh, and everybody went to them. Very interesting. I'm just thinking here, I mean, obviously we, we've touched on this as we think about sort of gender norms back then and appropriate roles for, for female abolitionists running. Obviously abolitionism gave them a voice and gave them power in ways that they maybe didn't have otherwise. But at the same time, we have these, these social norms at the time that maybe restricted them to different kinds of activities. But as you pointed out, such important activities such as the fundraising aspect of these fairs. And then we have Douglas obviously too, um, who, you know, was 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 a women's rights um, advocate. Um, you know, long before um, that was 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 anything big at all. And it's interesting to see him. Obviously, wherever he went, he went out of his way to reach out and to work with these female abolitionist societies, whether it was in Belfast or Cork or whatever. Well, um, that's absolutely correct, um, Adrian. And the, you know, the other thing too is that. Um, if you noticed um, with my slides, uh, there were no um, images of women, um, either mm -hmm. of Isabel um, or of uh, of Hannah um, Hannah Hinks, um, but there were pictures of her father, pictures of her brother, um, you know, and uh, you know that too was another kind of erasure um, that went um, that went on uh, in relation to the history of. Uh, of of women in you know not only obviously in ireland very good i have a question here for alistair i'm just monitoring the the, the chat here we don't have any questions coming in for alistair but obviously keep on contributing to these questions it might just be that they're, they're, they're still sort of coming to mind so do keep on uh, entering these into the chat and we might obviously be able to bring alistair back in to our next little discussion my question for for alistair here and it's it's sort of a half-baked question that i haven't probably figured out but I was struck with your talk here and it got me thinking, you know, Douglas is, is you know, becoming a, 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 a man. He's being treated as sort of a human being for the first time in, in his life, which is incredibly profound and powerful. But you speak there as well to his shape shifting nature too. You know, the fact that, that he's undergoing this, this transformation, but he's also able to sort of phase in and out with different contexts. And I find that sort of really interesting the fact that he was able to to utilize that in quite a powerful way I mean it's obviously an incredibly horrific thing to have not been treated like a human being until this particular moment but it seemed you see it's interesting here how that seemed to give him the ability in different contexts to be able to sort of connect in ways that maybe he couldn't have done if he had all that history and baggage before him so Am I barking up the right tree here, Alistair? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, Douglas obviously was on the move all his life, you know, not just geographically, but intellectually and mm -hmm. politically. Uh, I think that the time in, um, in 1845 to seven, I think it was a time of great transition in the sense that he was, you know, he, came, he, he came over from Boston as basically a kind of junior partner as like a, you know, an emissary of the American Anti-Slavery Society uh, that was, effectively under the spell of uh, Garrison. Uh, and yet by the time he'd left, he was on the way to returning to the States and setting up his own newspaper. And uh, of course at that point he kind of broke with Garrison. So I think the whole, all, all, it's tempting to kind of read a lot of this back you know, after, after knowing what that is that what happened. But you can certainly see, I think in a lot of these 
um, a lot of his speeches and engagements in Scotland and Ireland particularly, um, but he's starting to kind of distance himself slightly from Garrison and the philosophy of uh, moral suasion. Uh, and I think that's it's quite evident, I think, in, in the whole thing about the Black Douglas identification thing. It is, a, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting, I mean, it's almost like this kind of fictive kinship. He's almost like kind of, you know, asserting himself as this uh, ancestor of, uh, you know, a bloodthirsty, uh, you know, medieval lord, you know. Uh, and actually, when he keeps rewriting and he keeps returning to this comparison um, in the letter and letters and speeches, especially over about a week or 10 days in January, where you can see that he's slightly uncomfortable about this because he's actually identifying with someone who's basically famous for violence. Uh, and yet he's, there he is supposed to be, um, you know, belonging to this society, uh, which is sworn to pacifism, really. Mm -hmm. So and I think, so he keeps kind of making this identification and then kind of retreating from it. And then sometimes he, he says that passage that I read out, but he, he doesn't mention the Black Douglas and he just mentions, you know, heroes. He doesn't kind of be, he wasn't specific about it. So I think there's, that's going on at the same time as well, I think. We have a question here that's coming for you from uh, Liam. Um, he asks, um, could uh, to give us uh, his perspective of Douglas and the give back for, or the send back for money campaign in Scotland? And we have, you know, we've got a few minutes here if you're able to sort of give your thoughts on that send back for money campaign. Um, yeah, lots of things really. I suppose the Irish connection is quite interesting because I think the uh, the the, the, the whole thing about um, trying to persuade the um, um, the repeal movement to reject the donations that it was receiving from pro-slavery um, repeal groups in the United States was a kind of inspiration really for the uh, Send Back the Money campaign, which was modeled on the similar grounds in the sense that there was a big campaign which started well before Douglas arrived in Scotland uh, because the Free Church of Scotland, um, when it was formed in 1843, it didn't have state funding and it sent fundraising missions all over the place, including to the American South. Uh, and perhaps there's quite significant donations that were received there. I think one of the things about it is that it's not just about money. So I think even though it, it's, it was a very convenient symbol, this idea of the bloody gold and everything, but the main point that Douglas was making that it was really just, it was the fact that it was uh, extending the hand of friendship to the um, American churches, which were, you know, almost exclusively uh, pro-slavery. Um, and so the fact that this tree church didn't really send back the money wasn't the big issue. I think it was the fact that it was just alerting to the fact that there was a major institution in Scotland at the time that was um, willing to, um, I suppose, endorse or lend respectability to the American churches, which is what the abolitionists really didn't want to happen. So they were very happy in a way to be seen in Scotland, to have crowds cheering and shouting against the Free Church to show that this hand of respectability was uh, was was a controversial one. Really interesting. This might pop up later. I know Bill Ralston has talked about Belfast later on, and there's those connections um, between churches in, you see those connections between Belfast and, and, and Scotland later on with this bubbling up in the in the Belfast context too, before he, he headed over to Scotland. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Alistair. So we're going to take a little break here, a little intermission, um, just for 10 minutes. We'll get back here together um, at 4.20 p.m. Um, Irish UK time. Um, so quick intermission for 10 minutes or so. Or so. Um, um, so yeah, and we'll get back together. We've got uh, Lee Fort, uh, who's, who's coming next from uh, Le Moyne College um, in Syracuse, New York in about 10 minutes time. So quick intermission. Um, let all our panelists and everybody get out, go for a walk, or at least these days, walk around the, the house. Um, but, but yes, we'll be all back here in, in 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our Douglas uh, Symposium. Moving into um, our sort of middle section here, um, we have uh, Dr. Lee Fort here in a second, who I will um, introduce. Um, also following Lee, we have uh, Dr. Uh, James Finley. And following Dr. Finley, we have uh, Dr. Bill Ralston. So we have another three wonderful scholars, um, all of whom are Douglas um, experts. And we're going to move into learning an awful lot more about Frederick Douglass here um, and the context in which he worked and sort of a, the broader significance of his work, uh, not just within Ireland, but sort of looking at a global scale too. So uh, moving on here, without further uh, ado, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Lee Fort, um, as, I, as I mentioned. Uh, Dr. Fort is a professor. Um, at Le Moyne College in Syracuse, New York. Um, she edited the first volume of Frederick Douglass's correspondence published by Yale University Press in 2009. Uh, and more recently, Women in the World of Frederick Douglass uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2017. Um, welcome, Dr. Foote, it's great. She's got her book here too. Um, the title of her talk today is Back Home, Douglass's Family in His Absence. Um, again, I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Fort. Thank you so much for joining us um, today. Thank you. Um, I'm fresh from my COVID vaccine. So I hope I don't have um, any kind of reaction or froth at the mouth or turn into a zombie or just roll with it if I do. So the speakers here today have and will continue to travel with Douglas on his journey through Ireland, introducing us to the people he met, the ideas he encountered, all of which shaped his sense of self and influenced his ideology for decades afterwards. I, however, would like to look in a different direction, although no less significant, back home, describing important features of the life of the Douglas family and explaining their connection to his journey overseas and what home meant to him while he was away. Home, geographically speaking, meant Lynn, Massachusetts, north of Boston, where the Douglases, Douglases had moved in late 1847 from New Bedford. Ladies' shoe manufacturing was turning this industrial town into a city with a growing working class and the very first hints of Irish immigration. The working class had little love for abolitionist sentiment, however, because they believed that their anti-slavery employers such as Douglas's traveling companion, James N. Buckham, cared more for the enslaved laborers down south than the free ones on their own payroll. Now, whether this was true or not, the abolitionists were almost entirely middle to upper class, native born and white. And the city's recorded black population in the 1840s never rose above 1% of the overall. Still, Lynn's abolitionists targeted not only the slavery down south, but also complicity in the North and racial prejudice in their midst. Even the ever liberal Massachusetts had anti-miscegenation laws, segregated rails and segregated schools. While Frederick praised the soft gray fog of the Emerald Isle, where I breathe and lo, chattel becomes a man. His six-year-old daughter Rosetta had to go live with abolitionists Lydia and Abigail Mott in Albany, New York in order to receive an education because she could not expect to have one in her hometown. Home, emotionally speaking, meant Anna Douglas, formerly Anna Murray, Frederick's wife of nearly a decade. And home meant their four children, the aforementioned six-year-old Rosetta and her brothers, four-year-old Louis, three-year-old Frederick, and 10-month-old Charles, the baby. And these were their ages when their father had departed overseas. Holm also included the little-known Harriet Bailey. That was her alias. She's also named Ruth Cox, later Adams, who had lived with the Douglases since 1844 as their adopted or dear sister after fleeing slavery in Maryland just ahead of the auction block. And so Holm also met partnership. Anna Douglas had played a significant role in helping her husband escape slavery and establish himself in freedom. 
these 20 months that her husband spent abroad were not her first time single-handedly managing their household either. Ever since Frederick caught the eye of the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1841, he had spent ever increasing lengths of time away from home and 1845 to 47 was just the longest. Lecturing for the society may admit that Douglas could devote his time to the work of ending slavery rather than to manual labor, but it didn't pay much better and his trip abroad only added to the expenses. Anna's frugality, household labor, and understand that was hard physical labor in those days, and household production played a key role in enabling Frederick's work. And understand the historians have estimated that housework of a Northern antebellum woman like Anna could be valued at approximately $150 per year. No small sum in the 1840s, and that's $150, $1840 and also consider domestic labor is always undervalued. And that's close to like $5,000 today. So like other working class women with small children, Anna also took in piecework from the Lynn shoe factories to earn cash to sew the tops to the bottoms. So you know, all of this means that while Frederick traveled abroad in 1845 to 47, he earned his way through various anti-slavery funding sources and the sale of his narrative but he still had to split his income between his own expenses and his family's back home. Therefore, Anna's work was essential in the survival of their family and also allowing his, her husband to extend his tour. Home came to mean danger. Douglas repeatedly referenced the racism that characterized all of American society, making the threat of violence ever present for all African-Americans. And legally speaking, he was still a slave, as was the Douglas's adopted sister, Harriet Bailey. That made Anna an outlaw, according to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, subject to a fine of a $500, that's 518.40 dollars, or imprisonment. In 1846, Frederick's professed master, Hugh Auld, and I'm of course making a very complicated story simpler and shorter here, discovered Douglas's whereabouts as he was traveling through Scotland, Ireland, and England, and made known his intentions to claim his legal right to Frederick as property. While one faction of the abolitionist movement saw the simple solution as being pay off all and secure Douglas's freedom, another, and the one to which Douglas himself belonged, rejected the solution as a tacit acceptance of all's right to own another person. So separated from his family, facing certain enslavement should he return, and exposing Anna, Harriet, and his children to many potential consequences, he actually considered immigration, moving his home across the Atlantic. Then, the faction favoring, as they termed it, ransom, presented Douglas with his freedom papers, fifth complete. Douglas, of course, didn't refuse the gift, but faced with criticism from the opposing faction, his defense emphasized the happiness and repose of my family. It was worth more than paltry gold. And home was now becoming the object of curiosity. Interest in the Douglas family naturally extended from an interest in Frederick as a human and as a man in all of his roles. Yet, as with all public figures, Popular opinion develops expectations of its idols and can be harshly critical of anyone in their circle who falls short. Frederick had carefully shielded Anna from publicity by mentioning her only in the context of their marriage and his narrative. I have a whole thing as to why he wasn't treating her badly by doing that, but that's another story. Yet her very existence piqued interest as his fame grew and this first became apparent in the comments among abolitionists as Douglas traveled. Richard Webb, who's been mentioned already, and who, oh God, is he catty, um, and also unaware of the irony, asked, I apologize for my bad accent. <clears throat> I wonder how he would bear, be able to bear the sight of his wife after all the petting he gets from beautiful, intelligent, and accomplished women in a country where the prejudice against color is looked upon as a thing only laughed at. 
Isabel Jennings, who honestly, I love her and I'm so glad Dr. Ferrara has written about her. She's usually such a dear, but she's the one who let slip Anna's inability to read. And even as she defended Douglas's propriety against ladies who were rather absurd in their over attentions, seemed to judge Anna as less than well educated in all respects a companion for this impressive man. The popularity that followed the Douglas's home, along with his means of establishing his own newspaper and to move the family into the middle class, both socially and economically, marked a new era in their lives as well, in which they, and especially Anna, would have to police a barrier that allowed their family privacy while remaining aware of the face that their whole family presented to the world. As Douglas played a role of representative African-American manhood, his family had to play a similar representative role of African-American families. Home then was overtly politicized. But while he was gone, home was a place that Douglas missed where he longed to return, even as he himself extended his journey. Home was where my dear sister Harriet became engaged without his advice. How dare she? Home was where his baby son Charles grew older without remembering him. Home was where my dear Anna not allowed her to to expect me much for fear of being disappointed, but was exceedingly happy to see me. Home was where he could glory in the fight as well as the victory. So let's leave with the happy image of his homecoming. This is a bit of a passage and it'll be the end. As soon as it was possible to land at East Boston from the steamer, I leaped on shore and ran through a crowd of friends, simply bowing as I passed. I took the first train for Lynn. In 25 minutes, I reached Lynn, the train passing my door from which I saw all my family five minutes before getting home, because I had to get out at the station. When within about 50 yards of our house, I was met by my two bright-eyed boys, Louis and Frederick, running and dancing with very joy to meet me. Taking one in my arm and the other by my hand, I hastened into the house. Because home was not separate from the man and his big ideas. It was part of them. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lee. That was absolutely wonderful and, and so refreshing and important to, to shine a light on the folks who were facilitating Douglas's journeys. And it's, it's the usual story of behind every great man, right? Um, the the so-called supporting uh, cast, but again, here facilitating everything that, that, that he was doing. So Thank you so much. Um, and again, here so important, um, giving you know, given Douglas's um, advocacy for 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 women's rights too, to to realize that this was in the mix as well, and that heaven help us, it's 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 complicated too, right? You know, in terms of these 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 gender roles that, that he got sort of sucked into. So so yes, absolutely. Um, the book. Um, I'm looking forward to reading it um, myself. And obviously, um, please do, you know, you can get online, you can get on Google right now and learn an awful lot more um, about what Dr. Ford is, is, is talking about here this morning uh, or this afternoon. Okay, so we have some questions here that are coming in in the Q&A. Um, we're going to keep on rolling to our next panelist. But again, we have um, a little bit of a break um, coming up. Um, relatively soon and we'll have a discussion and I'm sort of scanning through these these questions so we'll have some questions hopefully coming in for Dr. for Dr. Fort here that we can come back to in our Q&A. I would encourage the rest of our panelists too to, to feel free to get onto the Q&A. You can type little answers in here and that kind of stuff ahead of time um, also. So thank you Dr. Fort um, again and hopefully we'll be back to see you here um, in a little bit with some with some questions. So moving on um, with our symposium here this morning, um, lots of, of, of different themes, lots of, of different things going on, obviously all sort of intersecting. Um, 
we have uh, Dr. James um, S. Uh, Finley, um, who is joining us today from the Lone Star State. Um, Dr. Finley is a professor at Texas A&M University, San Antonio. Um, his most recent publication from just last year, in fact, is titled Frederick Douglass in the United Kingdom from the Free Soil Principle to Free Soil Abolition. Uh, he is currently writing a book that addresses the literary production of radical abolitionists affiliated with the Free Soil Movement. Title of uh, Dr. Finley's talk this morning is Frederick Douglass in Ireland, Free Soil and Famine. So thank you so much, James, for joining us um, today. And I'm gonna turn it over um, to you. Thanks, my thanks to all the organizers. I'm really honored to be here with you all presenting along these co-panelists from whom I've learned a lot over the years. And my thanks to all of you who are tuning in, especially under the circumstances and all the demands on our, our time that we're facing. As many of you likely know, when Virginia merchant and slaver Charles Stewart sailed from, from Boston to London in 1769, he was accompanied by James Somerset, who was born in West Africa and had been enslaved by Stewart for approximately eight years. Two years into their stay in England, Somerset escaped from Stewart's control and fled into London. Stewart immediately ordered the pursuit of Somerset, who was captured after 56 days and incarcerated aboard a ship in the Thames in anticipation of sailing for Jamaica, where Stewart planned to sell Somerset. Before the ship departed, three British citizens submitted an appeal to Chief Justice Lord Mansfield for a writ of habeas corpus. Somerset's lawyers then argued before Lord Mansfield that people could be legally enslaved only in territories where bondage was protected by positive law. They thus claimed that an enslaved person became legally free if they ever reached territory where slavery was not formally protected. They referenced what was known as the free soil principle. The free soil principle stipulated that as soon as a person, sorry, as soon as an enslaved person sets foot on territory free from slavery or even breathes its air, then they are instantly transformed into a free subject. Lord Mansfield upheld this position, ruling that Stuart had no claim to James Somerset and thereby established the free soil principle within British jurisprudence. Although Lord Mansfield's decision did not in reality strike down slavery across the British empire, as many abolitionists claimed it did, his ruling did help to intensify anti-slavery sentiment in both England and the North American colonies. Anti-slavery factions in the US frequently invoked Lord Mansfield's decision and the free soil principle more generally in debates over slavery status and enslaved people who had come into territory where slavery was not protected by positive law petitioned courts in the North and the South, often successfully for their liberty. Now, Frederick Douglass was certainly familiar with the Somerset decision and with the free soil principle prior to his trip to the UK. But it was not until he reached Ireland, as far as I have been able to determine, that he made public reference to either. This is not surprising when one considers that Douglass, as he recounts in the 1845 narrative, certainly did not feel as though his status was instantly transformed upon reaching the, the North, nor that Northern Territory was in any way free soil. He portrays New York City as perceptibly hostile to black people and New Bedford as providing only what he calls a degree of safety. Were the North truly free soil, Douglas would not have had to travel to the UK following the publication of his narrative. So Douglas's first public references to the Somerset decision and to the free soil principle come in Limerick. This is on November 10th, 1845. And as part of a speech in which Douglas explains that he crossed the Atlantic because he is not safe anywhere in the US. It seems obvious therefore that the story of James Somerset took on newly personal resonance for Douglas as he himself stepped on Ireland soil and breathed its air. As the reconstruction of his speech in the Limerick Reporter presents it, Douglas argued that, quote, there was nothing like American slavery on the soil on which he now stood. There was no one spot in all America upon which he could stand free. Douglas then continues by noting that an acquaintance of his had to flee to British controlled Canada, quote, where alone on the American continent he could be safe. 
Douglas and his friend, therefore, both recognized that free soil did not exist in the US, and thus, in the spirit of James Somerset, they, fought, they sought freedom and safety abroad. Douglas's limerick speech then turns to the Somerset decision more directly, leaving behind his own anecdotal accounts and instead citing legal precedent and quoting from Irish nationalist John Philpot Curran, who was notably part of Somerset's defense team. As Douglas explains, quote, so true was it that the slave must leave his native soil to be free. In the language of Curran, their own orator, and here Douglas quotes from, from Curran, I speak in the spirit of the British law, which makes liberty commensurate with and inseparable from British soil, which proclaims even to the stranger and sojourner the moment he sets foot on British earth, that the ground upon which he treads is holy and consecrated by the genius of universal emancipation. Douglas here quotes from a 1794 speech in which Curran invokes the free soil principle in demanding freedom for Irish Catholics. The sentence that Douglas quotes, however, makes no reference to that specific context, but instead speaks to the immediate emancipatory pow power of British and specifically Irish soil, earth, and ground. The effect of these references then to the free soil principle and to Curran specifically is not only to celebrate British anti-slavery or jurisprudence, but also to highlight the role of Irish activists such as Curran and to use the Somerset decision to bring into relief the extent to which the US is decidedly not free soil. Douglas's references to Somerset relatively soon after his arrival in Ireland, therefore, serve both to celebrate Irish freedom fighters and to puncture the US North's self-presentation as distinctly different from the slave states to the South. To emphasize the second point, Douglas states immediately after his quoting of Curran that, quote, if an American ever came among them, and he means the Irish, speaking of the liberty of his country, let them make his cheek crimson by telling him that there is not a single spot in all his land where the sable man can stand free. Despite decisions such as Commonwealth v. Aves, this is from 1836, which freed the enslaved girl Med after her slavers brought her from New Orleans to Massachusetts, in which Paul Finkelman has described as, quote, virtually a total application of Somerset to Massachusetts, Douglas decidedly rejects the idea that Somerset applies to Massachusetts or that the free soil principle reflects conditions in the U.S. North more generally. So long as the U.S., Douglas suggests, protects slavery anywhere in its boundaries, free, truly free soil cannot exist. In a letter to William Lloyd Garrison, written in Belfast on January 1st, 1846, just prior to leaving Ireland for Scotland, Douglas again invokes the free soil principle at the foundation of the Somerset case. And this letter has been quoted before uh, in, in the, the sessions today. In this instance, writing to readers of the Liberator about his time in Ireland, Douglas is even more explicit in stating that free soil does not exist in the US. Although he admits that he experienced instances of anti-Black racism in Ireland, he nonetheless contrasts the land and people entirely favorably with the US. He notes that in Ireland, he lived free from fear of being captured and returned back to bondage, echoing the point he made in Limerick, Limerick that leaving the US affected a complete transformation. Behold the change, writes Douglas, 11 days and a half gone, and I have crossed 3000 miles of the perilous deep. Instead of a democratic government, I am under a monarchical government. Instead of the bright blue sky of America, I am covered with the soft gray fog of the Emerald Isle. I breathe and lo, the chattel becomes a man. Douglas here invokes the presumption at the core of the free soil principle that a certain sort of air makes one free. As he explains to readers of the Liberator, it is his first breaths of Ireland's air that transform him in a manner akin to his famous fight with Covey. But whereas the fight with Covey is presented as an exceptional act within the context of the US, freedom is the normative condition of Ireland embedded in the ground and contained within its air. The letter from, for American readers contains another comparative element that further emphasizes Douglas's point that free soil does not exist in the US, but that it can be found in Ireland. 
As Douglas explains, Ireland is characterized by, quote, the entire absence of everything that looked like prejudice against me based on the color of my skin. Douglas describes the Irish as, quote, animated with a spirit of freedom, showing black people what he calls deep sympathy, warm and generous cooperation, and kind hospitality, while at the same time expressing what he describes as strong abhorrence of the slaveholders. Douglas's portrait of the free soil of Ireland, this is to say, suggests that freedom is not simply rooted in its soil or circulates in its air. Rather, as the example of the Irish show, free soil conditions are created by the actions and commitments of people. It does not rest simply on a negative connotation of liberty as the absence of formal protections for bondage. It is particularly interesting that Douglas locates these decidedly positive examples of free soil in Ireland and not in England, where Somerset claimed his freedom. To this point, Douglas's references to the free soil principle notably drop off once he leaves Ireland for Scotland and England. So what are we to make of the fact that Douglas's references to the free soil principle come almost entirely during his time in Ireland? What I would suggest is that his portrait of the Irish people as committed to freedom and anti-racism and his hating of bondage in all forms shapes his presentation of truly free soil as that which is not a normative condition, but rather as something actively created and cultivated through struggle. On the one hand, Douglas's celebration of Ireland and the Irish to his readers in the US seems to reject the Anglo-Saxonism that shaped New England and that presented a commitment to liberty as the foremost feature of English people. As Nell Irvin Painter has demonstrated in her book, The History of White People, the Anglo-Saxonism popular in the antebellum North, while it did align with anti-slavery, reflected anti-Blackness and the presumption that the English are what Painter calls, quote, natural rulers of all races. Douglas witnessed that decidedly colonial rule in Ireland and recognized the oppression it fostered. His celebration of the Irish, therefore, refuses the exceptionalism of England and English people as naturally suited to liberty. On the other hand, the Irish were, of course, reeling from the Great Famine at the time of Douglas's visit. Many of the activists with whom Douglas met while in Ireland helped him to recognize that famine was not simply a natural disaster, but was, more broadly, an effect of what he would later identify as, quote, the injustice and oppression wrought by England on its colonial subject. As Douglas makes clear in a late career account of his trip, the famine conditions he witnessed in Ireland were not an effect of naturally inferior soil conditions or of an unexpected climactic change, but were rather caused by British colonialism. Making a connection to the Plantation South in an essay that he published in the AME Church Review in 1886, Douglas explains that Ireland was suffering from monoculture imposed by Britain's plantation system. Pre-famine Ireland and the antebellum South, he argues, were both characterized by an over-reliance on monoculture, which was compounded in both instances by terrible agronomic decisions of racist and venal landlords who were themselves uninvolved in day-to-day -day farming decisions and whose planning and management was decidedly anti-ecological and unsustainable. Like enslaved and formerly enslaved people in the US, the Irish have witnessed the intersection of racism, violence, and extractivist agriculture. And thus they recognize that freedom is not an inherent condition to certain soils, but is rather something that must be cultivated through practices of freedom and sustainability. In conclusion, I want to suggest that Douglas's consideration of the free soil principle in Ireland influences, at least in part, his abolitionism in the decades to follow, um, in the decades that follow his return to the States, excuse me, most notably his departure from Garrisonianism and his turn toward political abolitionism, often known in the US by the shorthand, the free soil movement. It is after his experiences in Ireland that Douglas joins free soilers in claiming that plantation monoculture has decimated landscapes in the US South and that the, the slave power's expansion into the West in the wake of the war against Mexico was in effect a colonialist lifeline for an ecologically unsustainable system. 
It is after partnering with Irish activists that Douglas begins to recognize the potential of political organizing and begins to move away from Garrisonian moral suasion. Soon after returning to the States, Douglas attends the inaugural Free Soil Party Convention held in Buffalo, New York, and he supports Free Soilism and the Free Soil Party in the pages of the North Star. Douglas's position with regard to the Free Soil Movement was intensely ambivalent. And even as he supported its goals of restricting the slave power's expansion, and even as he voiced a distinctly agrarian critique of plantation slavery in line with Free Soil Party politicians, he nonetheless consistently and explicitly denounced the movement's gradualism, its investments in whiteness, and its complacency with regard to unfreedom and anti-Blackness within the so-called Free North. What I want to say quickly, therefore, in conclusion, is that the essence of Douglas's persistent critique of the free soil movement and his vision of what it takes to create truly free soil begin to come into form during his time in Ireland. Whereas in England and in New England, white residents essentially took for granted that their territory was free soil. In Ireland, it is clear that free soil is not a normative or an essential condition. The Irish, like Douglas, reject the Anglo-American exceptionalism that treats freedom as an eternal condition for certain spaces and certain people. Both Douglas and the Irish instead see free soil as something that needs to be created and cultivated, something akin to what Catherine McKittrick calls, quote, sites of potentiality and existence that are recast through a struggle rather than complacency. Thanks very much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, James. Really interesting stuff. I know I took loads of notes um, there, not that you need to hear any more from, from me. So keep on um, uh, contributing here to the Q&A, um, everybody, if you have questions for Dr. Finley with regards to free soil and thinking about uh, Douglas. And, and also too, that was great to sort of think about race back then. And, and we can sort of maybe talk about some of that stuff in terms of how race worked back then and how the Irish could obviously be considered to be a different race from Anglo-Saxons with ideas of, of, of whiteness uh, sort of gelling later. Um, and we'll probably come back into that with some later um, panelists as well, because obviously Irish Americans played um, a role in, in sort of fermenting those different ideas of race um, in an American context as the 19th century wore on. So thank you so much, Dr. Finley. Um, we will hopefully come back to you here um, in our little uh, discussion um, that we'll have with Dr. Fort um, and Dr. Finley uh, in about 15 minutes or so. Um, we'll also have in that conversation um, and that discussion, uh, Dr. Ralston, um, who I'm going to introduce now. Um, Dr. Bill Ralston um, is uh, a professor emeritus at University of Ulster. He's the author of Frederick Douglass, a Black abolitionist in Ireland and Ireland of the Welcomes, uh, the Roots of Racism and Anti-Racism in, in Ireland. The title of his talk today is Douglas in Belfast, Preaching to the Converted. I would like to welcome uh, an old friend of mine, Dr. Bill Ralston, uh, today's uh, symposium. Thank you so much for joining us, Bill. Thank you, Adrian, glad to be here. Um, I'll just dive in without further ado, but first I'd like to share my screen if I can for a minute just. In 2012, Nettie Washington David Douglas, the great-great-granddaughter of Frederick Douglas, visited Belfast. She went to the mural of her ancestor in Northumberland Street and also wanted to visit places where Frederick had spoken when he was here in December 1845. Only one of those places remains, albeit in poor shape. Ironically, the Belfast Assembly Rooms building where it was also the place where in 1786, Waddell Cunningham and other rich Belfast businessmen tried to set up a slave trading company, a move that was opposed vehemently by Thomas McCabe, a jeweler and later a member of the Society of United Irishmen. The first of Frederick Douglass's seven lectures in Belfast was given just around the corner from the assembly rooms at the Independent Methodist Chapel in Donegal Street. <clears throat> Belfast City Council has recently agreed to erect a statue to Frederick Douglass in Donegal Street. 
Now, Frederick Douglass, Douglass was not the first nor only black abolitionist visitor to Belfast. Olauda Equiano, a former slave, came in 1791 as part of an eight month speaking tour throughout Ireland, during which he sold 1900 copies of his autobiography. He noted that he found the people of Ireland, quote, extremely hospitable, particularly in Belfast, end quote. Charles Lennox Remond, son of a prosperous black businessman in Salem, Massachusetts, came in 1841. He returned to the US bearing Daniel O'Connell's Great Irish Address, a petition signed by over 60,000 people asking Irish Americans to oppose slavery. Edmund Kelly, son of an Irish father and a slave, not only spoke in England and Ireland, but raised enough money to buy the freedom of himself and his family. Moses Roper spoke in 1841, not only in Belfast, but in Hillsborough County Down. And finally, William G. Allen spoke in Belfast and Downpatrick in 1855. He went on to become the first black school principal in England in a school in Islington. So Ireland, including Belfast, was on a well-trodden track for visiting abolitionists, black abolitionists. As it turned out, Frederick Douglass was the most significant black abolitionist Belfast visitor. Admittedly, he was only a young man of 27 at the time, but he was clearly a rising star. Although his visit to Belfast is worth considering, sorry, also his visit to Belfast is worth considering, not least because Belfast influenced him in significant ways, as he notes in his autobiography. I'll get to that shortly. Douglas spent about five months of his 18 month sojourn from the United States in Ireland, most of that in Dublin. He gave lectures there and in Cork, Limerick and Belfast. In Dublin, his main contact was Richard Davis Webb, a printer, Quaker and leading light of the, of the delightfully named group, the Anti-Everything Aryans. Anti-sectarian, anti-church, anti-colonial, anti-vivisectionists, vegetarians and abolitionists. This gives a clue to the circles that Douglas moved in, in in Dublin and indeed throughout Ireland, both in class and religious terms. It was during the famine and Douglas witnessed some of its most devastating effects. He wrote to William Lloyd Garrison, I see much here to remind me of my former condition. At the same time, he had little direct contact with the mass of the people who bore the brunt of starvation and disease, the peasantry. Instead, he spent his time mainly in middle-class circles. Moreover, they were non-Catholic middle-class circles, Methodist, Quaker, and particularly in Belfast, Presbyterian. Ireland's, and especially the North's middle-class was disproportionately non-Catholic. And O'Connell accepted Irish Catholics were not pro-abolition. Their stance was well summed up by Tyrone-born Bishop John Hughes of New York. The abolitionist, he said, is, quote, an anti-hanging man, a women's rights man, an infidel frequently, a bigoted Protestant always, a socialist, a red Republican, and a fanatical teetotaler. Douglas's contacts in Belfast were Presbyterians and other Protestants, such as James Stanfield, leading member of the Belfast Anti-Slavery uh, Committee, and the Reverend Isaac Newt Nelson, a Presbyterian minister who was later elected as a pro-home rule member of the British Parliament for a constituency in County Mayo. Now, when Alauda Equiano had visited Belfast in 1791, the United Irish Movement was in the ascendant, with its backbone of radical Presbyterians like Samuel Nielsen and Jemmy Hope. But Belfast had changed radically in the 54 years between Olauda's visit and Douglas's. Radicalism had been dealt a number of fatal blows, not least by the state repression that followed and indeed preceded the United Irish up Uprising of 1798. Perhaps an even big and bigger dampener on Presbyterian radicalism was the Act of Union of 1801. The Protestant bourgeoisie got most of what it had demanded, not as the United Irishmen had attempted through revolution, 
but through incorporation in empire, an empire which was still inextricably, inextricably linked to the slave trade. The obstacles to their economic and political progress as a class were removed, and they abandoned the old ambition of Theobald Wolf Tone, quote, a brotherhood of affection, a communion of rights, and a union of power among Irishmen of every religious persuasion, and thereby to obtain a complete reform in the legislature founded on the principle of civil, political, and religious liberty, end of quote. The Presbyterian middle class of Belfast was now more likely to be conservative, sectarian, and pro-imperialist. Having gained liberty for their class and indeed their sect, they tended to be less expansive in their definition of liberty. But a rump of radicalism remained, and it is that which Douglas encountered. Frederick Douglas was a profoundly religious believer all his life, yet he was painfully aware of the enigma that many of the slave owners he had encountered, including the most brutal, were also ostensibly deeply religious men. As he recounts his few days in Belfast meeting this rump of radical Presbyterianism, allowed him to begin to tackle head on the gap between appearance and reality when it came to religious fervor. Listen to his words at one public meeting on 26th of December, 1845. Imagine it if you can spoken with passion in his rich baritone voice to the accompaniment, as the Belfast newsletter put it, of cheers, shouts of hear, hear, and laughter and applause from the enthusiastic audience. Here's the quote. My motto is no union with the slaveholder because I believe there can be no union between light and darkness. I may be told, judge not that you be not judged. I admit the truth of that part of scripture, but those who read it to me should read a little further where it is said, by their fruits ye shall know them. I do not judge you when you cut me if I cry out that you hurt me. It is not judging the state of your soul when I tell you that you have done me an injury. I know that by injuring me, you are acting contrary to Christianity. And when you tell me that there are some Christian slave owners in the States, I tell you, as well may you talk of sober drunkards. A man becomes the more cruel, the more the religious element is perverted in him. If they are women whippers, cradle plunderers and man stealers before their conversion, they are women whippers, cradle plunderers and man stealers after it. And that religion is to them but an additional stimulant to reenact their atrocious deeds. Frederick Douglass's main target during that talk that night was Reverend Thomas Chalmers of the Free Church of Scotland. Chalmers had broken with the Church of Scotland, taking one third of the ministers and half of the laity with him, and he needed money to build up his new endeavor. So members of his free church went to the United States on a fundraising tour. They had little success in the North, but in the slaveholding South were particularly successful. Chalmers had been criticized over accepting money from slave owners in a pamphlet published by the Belfast Anti-Slavery Committee. And so Douglas was speaking to a knowledgeable and sympathetic audience when he focused on the hypocrisy of people like the Reverend Thomas Chalmers. And he echoed the anti-slavery committee slogan, send back the money. After Belfast, Douglas moved on to Scotland. There he continued the attack on Chalmers, pointing out the irony of a church calling itself free, yet supporting slavery. Everywhere he spoke, send back the money was taken up as a popular slogan. It was even cut out of the turf to create huge letters on Arthur's seat in Edinburgh. Of course, the Free Church of Scotland fought back. One of its members in South Carolina, Reverend Thomas Smith, originally from Belfast, tried spreading the rumor that Douglas had been seen coming out of a brothel in Manchester an impossibility given that the rumor was started before Douglas had arrived in Manchester. And when Douglas returned briefly to Belfast in June 1846, Free Church of Scotland members distributed flyers with the message, 
send back the N word. In conclusion, what his experience in Belfast convinced Frederick Douglass was that just as religion could be a force for slavery, it could also be a force for emancipation. This insight was surely a confirmation of what he knew rather than a revelation. But the difference was that what might just have been an aspirational rhetoric became real and tangible in Belfast. There, Frederick Douglass met fervent religious men who were the stark opposite of those he had encountered in his childhood and youth, the slave owners. The Presbyterians of Belfast were a breath of fresh air, a living embodiment of an aspiration central to his heart. As is evident from his autobiography, and indeed from the themes in his talks for some time afterwards, that experience stayed with him, buoyed up his own religious faith, and was a powerful political message to deliver, not only to the converted, but also to others who might see the relevance of the message. That's it, folks. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, lots there to think about. So again, here, keep on um, contributing to our, our Q&A. Um, we've got some time now. So we have maybe 15 minutes or so now until 5.20 p.m. Um, to run through some of those questions um, in the Q&A. Um, but hopefully um, our uh, panelists um obviously we have we have bill um had questions here for professor ralston for dr ralston that'd be wonderful uh, we also have uh, dr finley um and before that we obviously have dr uh, fort um as well um and if there's questions for everybody else too um we're going to make sure that we have some time at the end of this symposium where maybe we can get all our panelists up on the screen here to run back through any previous questions but um maybe just came in a little bit later um but that we can address to our to our panelists um okay so i'm just sort of emceeing here and i'm just looking through the uh the, the q a so keep on contributing here to the to the your questions um to our panelists and i'll do my best to, to pass these on one question we have here is actually from one of our panelists to another panelist that can get us started um this is actually um aimed at it's a question of Dr. Finley here, um, and it's from uh, Dr. Pettinger. And the question is uh, that Alistair just wanted to ask James whether he thought Douglas uh, following Cohen exaggerated the impact of Somerset's judgment. Um, the understanding here was it was ambiguous and while it led to subsequent decisions in favor of the claims of enslaved petitioners in England, it also, even into the 1830s and 1840s, didn't prevent decisions um, in favor of, uh, of slave owners. Um, so any thoughts on, on that question, Dr. Finley? Sure, thanks very much for the, for the question and thanks for sending it to me in advance. So I had a, a moment to to gather my thoughts here. I, I appreciate that. I think that Douglas most certainly exaggerated the, the impact and the and the significance of the Somerset decision when he was speaking in, in Ireland. And I say that because on a on a personal level, he could have applied for he could have appealed for his for his own freedom in, in Massachusetts in the way that others did and he did not, right? Um, especially after the publication of the of the narrative when his when his safety became even more precarious, he 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 decided to to go abroad, and that's because it was not clearly established in the U.S. as precedent. Although many people did succeed in their in their freedom suits, not not all not not everyone did, and there was a concern that because Somerset was decided prior to the American Revolution, that the that the Constitution. Um, superseded it in the constitution, of course, with the 1793 Fugitive Slave Law provides means and, and resources for, for enslavers to, to, to track down people. By invoking it abroad, he is doing what, um, what Alan Rice calls strategic Anglophilia and criticizing the US and American sociality and politics to 
uh, a, an audience to, to, to a different audience as a means of making a, a, a political argument. And as I tried to lay that lay out, that political argument is a uh, an, an attempt to puncture the self presentation of the U.S. North as the site of free free soil, a site of freedom. A lot of the folks who were involved in the free soil movement would use the language of the free soil principle, would cite Somerset directly. Douglas's neighbor in Massachusetts, Charles Sumner did this multiple times. Even fugitives such as Douglas did this. Um, Jermaine Loguin does this in, in Rochester. And Douglas, I think, finds it a helpful rhetorical and political move to say that the U.S. North has a lot of work to do if it's going to reach its stated goals of being a, a space and a polity that's different from the from the U.S. South. So I think that it the, the fact that he's doing it in Ireland um, to me signals that it's it's not something that he takes very seriously as legal precedent. But thank you for that that really helpful question. Wonderful, Dr. Billy. I'm, I'm obviously a geographer and I, I can't help but think about sort of Douglas spatially here and you know where and how sort of attuned he is to his locations whether that's you know in Ireland in general or in sort of specific places where he was he was talking um, I noticed in some of my own research that he not only raised that Somerset case in in, in Limerick um, with Phil Pot Cohen mentioned but he also did the same when he was at the mansion house being entertained by the Lord Mayor of Dublin um, so again, here it's sort of interesting to think about the, the contexts in which he 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 raised it, um, and then when he other times when he maybe he, he maybe didn't mention it. But but yes, it's a wonderful point to think about how he used it almost as like a rhetorical uh, device in many ways. Um, and despite obviously witnessing in in Ireland um, some evidence to to suggest that. <sighs> Free soil wasn't, you know, wasn't a given and had to be had to be fought for. And he's he's sort of it's interesting how he's sort of walking that that line in, in this particular context. So wonderful. Um, I'm keeping on looking at the, the the questions here as they as they come in and obviously keep on contributing to our our Q and A. If you have any questions for our panelists here before us. Um, reading the last one here, but I think it was a good one. So let's see, learning to read and write was, was Douglas's first step to freedom. Um, and he wasn't unlike the Catholics in Ireland under the penal laws in this regard. Uh, did Douglas have any engagement with the religious orders who were trying to establish schools for Catholics at the time? For example, Edmund Rice, Catherine McCauley, uh, Nano Nagel's successes in the presentation order. I don't know if any of our panelists here have any thoughts on Douglas's um, engagement with um, religious orders um, in Ireland engaging schools for Catholics at the time? I mean I can offer something largely just sort of drawing on, on our panelists so far is just to sort of you know think about and this is something that, that Bill pointed out too um, how the circles that, that, that Douglas moved in, um, how he knows what side his, his, his bread is buttered on, so to speak, realizing that he had to stay with his, his Protestant um, hosts and that, that abolitionism was, was, was stronger at the time um, with them, knowing that if he, you know, went off into sort of various sort of Catholic causes at the time, too strongly, um, but that could sort of alienate his, his Protestant hosts to some extent. So he's, he's walking that line in terms of he's, he's speaking at, at temperance events. That's one sort of venue in which he, he addresses um, Roman Catholics at the time. But again, you know, he's, he's trying not to veer too much into, at least from my perspective, um, Catholic causes, um, even though he's, 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 he's clearly <laughs> simple. Um, is that something you, you'd agree with, Bill? Uh, yes, I'd go a little bit further. Uh, you, were, you were slightly nice to him there mm -hmm. <laughs> in that he took the pledge personally from Father Matthew, you know, the, 
total abstinence to, uh, to abstain from alcohol for, for life, which he had already, that was already his lifestyle anyway. Mm. Uh, but he, he got, I think he went a little bit overboard in Ireland uh, in relation to that, where he, 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 he claimed that the main problem for the Irish peasantry and the Irish poor was that they were that they were way led by alcohol. That alcohol was the biggest uh, issue facing Ireland. Now I, I recognise what, what James was saying, and it's absolutely right that he was no fool that he, he, he saw colonialism in, in action too, and the effects of colonialism. But yet, on the other hand, it, it's, it always struck me as quite odd that uh, he picked out alcohol as being the main culprit. So that was, to my knowledge, his you know other than his. His, his brief meeting and his, his adulation of uh, Ireland's most famous Catholic, uh, Daniel O'Connell, um, the, the, the main connection he had was with the temperance uh, movement. Interesting. I mean, this is something that, that this whole week we'll, we'll touch on. And in recovering Douglas, you know, do we recover him warts and all? I think it's important mm. to pay attention to the fact that, that you know, he's, he's quite a sort of a nuanced um, um, character. Um, there's, there's lots there to sort of recover and, and, and to celebrate. Um, but, the, you know, these are these questions of, of history being written from the vantage point of the present. And, and Adrian, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm perfectly happy to give him a break here in that he was 27 years of age. Yes. He had never been out of the United States. Suddenly he's in some, somewhere which for all it might have had similarities to his experience of slavery, was, was another planet in many ways, you know? So uh, he's allowed to get a couple of things wrong. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, uh, Adrian, this is Patty. Yes. I, I also think that, um, I also think that uh, the, I, the, you know, the suggestion that he was walking a very tight line is important. And he did, he did take the pledge from Matthew, but when Father Matthew came to the United States, Douglas was heartbroken um, by Father Matthew because he wouldn't, uh, you know, he wouldn't disown slavery when, when he was in the South. And so, and I know that my woman, um, Isabel, she also walked the line in relation to, um, you know, there was Catholic participation in the Cork Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, but, um, you know, she was very mindful of the fact that, um, you know, the Catholic population. Oops. Did we lose Patty there all of a sudden? She was on a roll. I mean, later when Father Matthew got into trouble uh you know because of the 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 cost of the temperance medals hmm. um you know jennings you know said but geez they love him so you know we've we've got to help him out here and no but the, the, i think this is this is a, a, a great discussion here it's just to to Think about Douglas sort of walking that line as, as, as Patty points out there. Um, okay, we are, let me just scan here for a few more questions for the next couple of minutes. Let's see if we have anything else in the Q&A. Again, keep on contributing to the Q&A and we'll try to get these questions on to our, to our panelists. Any questions we have for each other while we're here for a minute or two, are we, are we looking? All right, we'll keep, we're gonna keep on rolling here. I know I've got, I've got lots of, of, of thoughts here too, and I'm gonna collect some of my, my questions too um, for, for later on. Um, okay, we are gonna take another one of our little uh, breaks. Um, again, just sort of a, a chance just to, just to get away from, from Zoom for a few seconds, go uh, put the kettle on or whatever it is you would like to do. Um, we will be getting back together here. Let's see, we'll be getting back together um, at um, it's like 12.30, uh, um, my time, which is 5.30 p.m. Um, in Ireland. So again here, quick break, um, just for 10 minutes um, or so, and then we're gonna be back with uh, Dr. Kaufman McKivigan um, 
from who's a professor at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. So again, 10 minutes, quick break, and we'll all get back together. Thank you so much. Good morning, Paul. I think we're live here, but I just thought I would say a quick hello to you in, in Sydney, Australia. We're in a little uh, intermission. Um, ah, yes. At the yes. moment. Uh, um, good. Yeah, everything's, everything's going wonderful. Um, lots of wonderful questions coming in in our, in our Q&A. Um, right. 
Our intermission is going to sort of end here in about five minutes or so. We might yeah. be sort of live to everybody right now. I don't know, but that's that, that's yeah. fine. Um, and I'm just uh, I'm just trying to find the, the, how to get the uh, the the screen um, the the background. Um, okay. Yeah, I can send you. Uh, I just sent it out there. I can send you um, this little. Uh, I think I have it in an email here. And I think I. I think I've got the. Um, I think I've got the, the, uh, the, the background somewhere. But I just need to find the settings uh, uh, button if I can do that okay. for Zoom. Um. You still there, Adrian? I am still here. I can't quite start start my video yet, but I can I can hear you. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're moving into our third little section of our symposium here. Um, we have in this section, we have um, Dr. Kaufman McKivikin, um, who's going to go first, and then we have Dr. Uh, Peter O'Neill. And then following uh, Dr. O'Neill, we have uh, Dr. Giles uh, joining us all the way from Sydney, Australia. Um, very nicely 
got up very early in the morning tomorrow um, to, to join us here today. Okay, so let's let's uh, keep on rolling here. And thank you too for all the questions that are coming in on the on the Q and A. Some more have come in there in the last five ten minutes. Um, so we'll make sure that we address these um, at the close of, of our talk today. We're going to have at least an extra 15, 20 minutes or so um, when we'll try to sort of aim these questions at, at, at all our panelists, um, which would be wonderful. So I'll try to make sure that I get through uh, these uh, questions and give you guys some, some answers. All right, so without further ado here, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Kaufman McKivigan from the Indiana University, Purdue University, uh, Indianapolis. Um, Dr. Kaufman McKivigan is a professor um, at this university. He's the editor of the Frederick Douglass Papers edition, a part of the Institute for American Thought at IUPUI. Um, his uh, talk uh, today is titled Fair Play for the Irishman. Frederick Douglass and Irish Home Rule. So without further ado here, I would like to welcome uh, Jack Kaufman McKivigan to our symposium. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, and thanks Thanks for inviting me. Um, in my experience, if I have a short amount of time and I try to summarize when, what I wanna say, it usually takes longer. So therefore I'm gonna read from, from my talk and I think we'll get it done more quickly. All right, my topic is Fair Play for the Irishman, Frederick Douglass and Irish Home Rule. The issue that most severely tested Frederick Douglass's warm regard for the British people in the decades after the American Civil War was that of Irish Home Rule. In addressing this divisive political issue, Douglass reminisced about the friendly support that both Ireland and England had given him during the abolitionist crusade. He acknowledged that some of his British friends, such as John Bright, opposed home rule for Ireland and admitted that, quote, the spirit of the age does not favor small nationalities, end quote. Nevertheless, in both speeches and writings, Douglas gave his support behind the Irish home rule. This brief examination of Douglas's public statements on home rule will demonstrate how his unswerving faith in the principles of universal human rights guide his advocacy for the cause of Ireland. In August 1845, Douglas had sailed from Boston to the British Isles to avoid possible capture and re-enslavement after the publication of his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, had made his identity known to his Maryland slave owner. Leaving his family behind, Douglas commenced a 21-month tour of Great Britain and Ireland. While in Ireland, Douglas received uh, significant assistance for his anti-slavery cause from Irish abolitionists, as well as Irish nationalists, such as Daniel O'Connell, who I'll be mentioning a number of times. Douglas experienced unprecedented personal freedom and unparalleled public approval in Ireland that would leave him forever changed. Douglas's time in Ireland in the 1840s has been the sub, well, we, all the brilliant scholarship we have gathered here today, uh, you're all familiar with. In the next four decades, Douglas frequently reminisced about his liberating experiences in Ireland. Ironically, Douglas learned that the Irish immigrants to the United States were rarely active abolitionists and were often virulent racists. Themselves a victim of nativist prejudices against the Roman Catholic faith, Irish Americans found it difficult to break out of the lowest socioeconomic rungs of antebellum American society. Regarding free blacks as their principal economic competitors in many American cities, however, Irish immigrants frequently joined violent riots to drive them out of the most sought after uh, employment opportunities. In a series of newspapers that Douglas edited in Rochester, New York, he regularly contrasted the racism and pro-slaveryism of Irish Americans with the uncompromising abolitionism of the now deceased Daniel O'Connell. During the Civil War and Reconstruction era, Douglas frequently compared the history of mistreatment of the recently emancipated African-American slave and the Irish peasant. He regularly recited O'Connell's observation that, quote, the history of Ireland might be traced like a wounded man through a crowd by his tracks of blood, end quote, and then significantly declared, quote, incomparably more truthful May this statement be made respecting the Negro, end quote. 
The Home Rule campaign, though part of a long-standing Irish nationalist move, well, I, I don't need to tell you people about the Home Rule movement, I'll skip that. Uh, as, as that campaign was uh, developing, uh, Douglas had become a well-known figure in the United States. He easily shifted his brilliant rhetorical powers from the emancipation campaign to support of such other causes as temperance, women's suffrage, and most of all, African-American civil rights. Douglas relocated to the American capital of Washington, DC, where he briefly ed edited his fourth newspaper and then held a series of significant federal government appointed offices. His first wife, Anna Murray Douglas, died in 1844. 1884. A year and a half later, Douglas married the younger Helen Pitts, a white journalist, creating a controversy among both of their families in the district's African American community. This unfriendly climate helped convince Douglas to accept invitations from old abolitionist friends in Europe to visit them. Douglas's long planned honeymoon with Helen Pitts Douglas was delayed from April to September 1886 by a confirmation fight in the US Senate over his successor as recorder of deeds of the District of Columbia. During that summer, Douglas prepared an article for the AME Church Review, recalling his visit to Ireland in the mid 1840s. In this article, Douglas praised the initial home rule effort and its proponents in 1886. Quote, with better intentions, with loftier aspirations, with larger experience, or with a more masterly in intellect, no Irish statesman has ever attempted to grapple with what is called the Irish problem than William E. Glasson, end quote. Nonetheless, Douglas acknowledged that there was some merit to the arguments of the opponents of home rule, quote, as in the case of our maintenance of our union, the Civil War, I believe that good order, liberty, and civilization will be better served and better received in the union of Great Britain and Ireland than outside of it. Ultimately, however, Douglas provided a strong endorsement of home rule in this essay. Quote, I have favored home rule for Ireland for two reasons. First, because Ireland wants home rule. And secondly, because it will free England from the charge of continued oppression of Ireland. Whether the condition of the Irish people would be improved by the change is another question. But whether they are improved or not, the proper judges and the responsibility should be laid upon them. I am for the fair, pay, I am for the fair play for the Irishman, the Negro, the Chinaman, and for all of whatever country or clime, and for allowing them to work out their own destiny without outside interference, end quote. As he would time and again, Douglas stressed that the same justification for Irish rights should be applied in equal measure to his own race. By the time his article had been published in the AME Church Review, Douglas and his second wife had reached the British Isles where they were warmly entertained as house guests by aging abolitionists whom he had befriended in his earlier visits as well as by their children. Most of these English and Irish, uh, most of these English and Irish religious dissenters and political radicals warmly supported Gladstone's home rule efforts. For example, Douglas renewed his friendship with Helen Bright Clark, who broke with her father, John Bright, over home rule and advised Douglas on the issue. Douglas briefly toured Ireland, but found few surviving friends, lamenting, quote, they were all gone, and except for some of their children, I was among strangers. These received me in the same cordial spirits that distinguished their fathers and mothers." End quote. After nearly a year traveling, Douglas returned home to the British, uh, returned home from the British Isles for the last time in August 1887. Shortly after his return from travel in Europe, Douglas was invited to a reception at the Metropolitan AME Church in Washington. He addressed the friendly crowd and his remarks were later published in the Baltimore Commonwealth. Douglas reported to his American audience on the divisive impact of home rule debate in British politics. Quote, no question of modern times has stirred England as deeply as this. 
It has rent asunder parties, cast down leaders, broken up friendships, and divided families. Men who have acted together in politics for nearly a half century have all at once found themselves widely separated on this vast and vital question, end quote. Douglas made his own position clear. He endorsed the passage of Home Rule, quote, both for the sake of England and for the sake of Ireland. The former will throw off a tremendous load both in money and in reputation by granting it. The glory of England will increase, will cease to be soiled with shame for the grievances of Ireland. And Ireland will be, will be put upon her own good behavior before the world and made responsible for her own good or ill condition, end quote. Douglas had visited Parliament during the debates over Home Rule, and he offered his audience an assessment of Gladstone, one that was quite the reverse of his harsh denunciation of the British leader during the Civil War for sympathizing with Confederate independence. Douglas declared, quote, his speech was one of the grandest I have ever heard and was listened to with profound silence by the whole house. My expectations were high, very high, but in some respects, they were far exceeded, end quote. Douglas applied it, applauded Gladstone for favoring, quote, the rule of justice rather, instead of the rule of the bayonet, the rule of love instead of the rule of hate, the rule of trust and confidence instead of the rule of doubt and suspicion, end quote. A couple of months later, Douglas gave his strongest public endorsement to the home rule cause. He accepted an invitation to attend and address a, a reception in Washington, D.C., hosted by the local Irish American community for two visiting Irish members of the British Parliament who were active Home Rule supporters. A stream of senators, congressmen, and other dignitaries, as well as the Irish MPs, addressed the gathering. Douglas was among the last speaker to address that gathering. He told the reception, quote, when I received the invitation to come here, I thought it a good thing, a good thing for me and a good thing for the people that I in some measure represent. For I hold it an honor to sit on this platform. I was glad of the opportunity of coming if merely to give color to the occasion. There was, a, there was laughter after that in the original. Uh, later he declared, Quote, I thank you for letting me sit on the platform with these white people. You know, it's not the usual thing in America. I am very glad to be here and to let you look me in the face and to see that you don't get angry with my woolly head, my high cheekbones and my distended nostrils or any of my features. And that you have really discovered that Fred Douglas is a man. Remember, he's talking to an Irish American audience. Uh, Douglas assured his uh, Irish American audience and reporters who were covering this event for, the, uh, for a worldwide reading audience, that he was not speaking as an enemy of Britain, declaring, quote, I'm not here, uh, I'm not here this seeming to fan the flames of Irish animosity. If there be any such animosity toward England, Douglas noted that he had recently returned to the United States from visiting friends in England and Ireland. Douglas praised modern day, quote, liberal England, end quote, that he contended were, quote, all on the right side and mean to be until the battle was fought and won, I mean, favoring Irish home rule. Douglas quoted Daniel O'Connor several times uh, to considerable applause from this Irish American audience. Douglas reminisced that O'Connell had called him the, quote, Black O'Connell of America, end quote, at a meeting in Dublin's Conciliation Hall 40 years earlier, which was referenced in other talks. Douglas praised O'Connell for drawing parallels to the plight of the slave and the Irish tenant, quoting the Irishman saying, my sympathies are not confined to the narrow limits of my own green Ireland. My spirit walks abroad with the clement waters. Wherever there is oppression, I hate the oppressor. Wherever the tyrant rears his head, I will launch his, my bolts upon it, end quote. Douglas then attempted to duplicate O'Connor's efforts by stressing to the reception audience the similarity in the oppressed position of the modern Irish and the 
recently liberated African American. In his advocacy for the Irish, Douglas simultaneously advanced the cause of his own race, proclaiming that, quote, I am therefore with every other American of whatever color or class an out and out home roar for Ireland and an out and out home roar for every man in this Republic. The right that I am claiming for Ireland, I claim for every man here, North and South, end quote. Douglas relied upon the same principles of natural law and universal liberty that he had employed for decades in the abolitionist movement. Quote, there is no such thing as limiting the spirit of liberty. Liberty, why is it, why it is like the sun in the heavens, it shines for all. National lines, geographical borders, do not and cannot confine it. It belongs to the whole world and the whole world has a right to stand up in its behalf. For when it is struck down in one direction, it is struck down in another and in all directions. Dur During the full length of his public life from the 1840s to the 1890s, Douglas championed the cause of Irish American nationalism. He viewed both Irish and African American rights as inseparable expressions of fundamental human rights. Significantly, Douglas never failed to point out that those same principles that demanded self-determination for the Irish could be applied to the African Americans campaign for full political rights. While Douglas frequently protested the discrimination that Irish Americans displayed toward his race, he devoted much more attention toward recalling the devotion toward human rights displayed by Ireland's leaders. Most of all, he repeatedly praised Daniel O'Connell's willingness to fight for the cause of the slave at the same time as the cause of Ireland. In returning that favor 40 years later in the Home Rule campaign, by championing the aspirations of the Irish as well as the African-American, Douglas truly earned that sobriquet bestowed on him in Dublin in 1846, the Black O'Connell. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Kaufman McKivigan, please do type them into our, our q and I know I've been making notes again here and possible things to, to talk about um, in our final uh, discussion that we'll have. Without further ado here, I'm gonna keep on rolling though to our next uh, presenter. Um, we're lucky enough today to have uh, Dr. Peter O'Neill uh, joining us from the University of Georgia. Uh, Dr. O'Neill is a professor um, at the University of Georgia. He's the co-editor of the Black and Green Atlantic, Cross Currents of the African and Irish Diasporas. He's also author of Frederick Douglass and the Irish, and he's currently working on a new book titled Green Crossing White, Famine Irish and the American Racial State. Um, which I suspect he's gonna be drawing from a little bit today. The title of his talk is Douglas, Irish America and the Racial State. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Adrian, uh, for organizing this panel and to all at uh, UCC and beyond for putting together this wonderful week of events. It's really a, a privilege to be part of it. So the title of my talk uh, is Frederick Douglas, Irish America and the Racial State. And I hope to cover uh, the following points in my talk. First, I'll give a, I want to give a brief account of how I got interested in Douglas in Ireland in the first place and draw a line from it to my current scholarship. And then, then I want to outline the term racial state and uh, discuss uh, Douglas's time in Ireland during the Great Famine briefly. Uh, third, then I'll contrast that with a brief description of the famine Irish migration to America and discuss the difference of important distinction between citizenship and nationality as it relates to their experiences. And then finally, I just want to zip through a mere 180 years and one Cork New York minute to bring us to the present time. So fasten your seatbelts there. So I first found out about Douglas uh, five, uh, five months in Ireland in a graduate class in 19th century American literature. And I know someone has a, had a question on that subject in in uh, in the chat box 
Doug, it changed my, knowing about Douglas, finding out about him, it really changed my research uh, focus uh, to the Black and Green Atlantic. His experiences, I realize, offers us a great insight into what it means to be Irish, what it means to be American, and more importantly, what it means to be human. So I came of age in the late 60s, Derry, as the civil rights movement emerged, exposing sectarian fissures off the Northern Ireland state. Inspired by the Black Civil Rights Movement in the US, we sang We Shall Overcome after each meeting and Dr. Martin Luther King was, was quoted frequently from the platform. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic in Boston, if just a couple of years later, Irish Americans were leading the anti-busing campaign uh, against uh, school integration. So, you know, what happens to Irish people when they cross the Atlantic, I thought. I knew the, the answers were more complex than that question and it continued to pu puzzle me after I emigrated to the US in the early 80s. So in the graduate class 20 years later I realized that Frederick Douglass's Irish visit provides a way of unraveling that complexity. So fast for, forward to my current uh, project which is a cultural history of white nationalism in Irish America. Um, the project includes uh, an analysis of the work of Eugene O'Neill and his problematic relation to race. So in his masterpiece, Lawn Day's Journey in Tonight, we find a quote that might make an excellent model, uh, motto, not only for, for my paper, but maybe for this uh, Douglas week. Mary, the matriarch of the Tyrone family, when implored by her husband, James, to forget the past, she says, how can I? The past is the present, isn't it? It's the future too. So O'Neill then knew that we cannot possibly understand our present or shape our future without acknowledging our past warts and all. And Frederick Douglass's experiences are invaluable to us in that regard, particularly in the wake of recent political events uh, in, in here in the US. So let me move to part two, the racial state. In defining the term, uh, David Theo Goldberg argues that race is uh, integral to the emergence and development and transformations of the modern uh, state formation. And I, I deal with this in my book that was published last year, uh, uh, the, American, uh, the Famine Irish and the American Racial State. But um, so I'll give you a, a, a little a brief um, sortie into that. Thus, when, when Douglas set sail on the Cambria bound for Liverpool with a price in his head, his so-called honor was hunting him down with the aid of American law. He was leaving the American racial state, a modern uh, state formation where governmental structures denied him his very humanity, as well as that of other enslaved uh, African-Americans, indigenous peoples, Asians, and others deemed non-white by the state. Indeed, since its foundation, racist laws have underpinned the United States at every level, you know, state, federal, state, and local. Douglas stayed in Liverpool for a couple of nights before crossing Mary's Sea to Dublin, entering a racial state of a different kind, the British colonial state in Ireland. And there, as uh, Tricia Ferreira and Fanula Sweeney have noted, Douglas became the modern subject. And this is quoted earlier, but I'll, -quote, I'll quote it again. He famously, famously wrote back to America about his Irish experience. He said, I breathe the air and lo, the chattel becomes the man. His relationship with the state in which he now found himself utterly changed his subjectivity. Whereas in America, Douglas was regarded as a thing, a piece of property. In Ireland and Britain, his humanity was both recognized and acknowledged. Of course, through, the, through its ruthless uh, colonial conquest, not only in, only in Ireland, but throughout the globe, the British colonial state was a racial state too, but in Ireland or in Britain itself, Douglas presented no threat to the domestic racial order since black presence in Ireland and Britain was minimal. Douglas was well aware that those hosting him, as you know, Bill pointed out earlier, uh, were in general upper and middle class uh, unionists, more, more than a few unbothered by the terrible conditions of the Irish peasantry. Uh, Douglas was focused on his abolitionist cause first and foremost and would have not wish to offend his hosts by attacking the colonial system that produced such suffering. Yet he was genu genuinely taken aback 
uh, by the abject poverty and su suffering he did witness and recorded his shock uh, in several letters back to the US. 1845 was, as we know, the year in which uh, began the 19th century Europe's most uh, devastating demographic disasters. Uh, and Gorts of Moore, the Great Hunger, also known as uh, the Great Irish Famine. So between 1845 and 1855, between 1 1.1 and 1 1.5 million people died of famine or famine-related diseases. Another 2.1 million fled the country, uh, 1.8 million uh, of which uh, fled to uh, North America. While famine victims came from every sector of uh, Irish society, undoubtedly the vast majority of those who fled and uh, those who died were impoverished Catholics, many who came from the less arable uh, lands to the west and south of the country and often from Irish speaking communities. So this group uh, whom I refer to in my book uh, are, as the famine Irish were forced to leave their native uh, land by British administration besotted by, among other things, um, lazy fair capitalism, religious fanaticism, and the economic gospel of Thomas Malthus, who had labeled the Irish peasantry as, quote unquote, a disposable population. In effect, the Malthusian inspired British administration racialized Irish poverty. In this third section, I will, I will discuss the famine Irish in America and highlight the difference between citizenship and nationality, because it, it's important here. Upon, a, on a, excuse me, upon arrival in the US, the famine Irish endured great hardship. The combination of their Catholic religion, Irish ethnicity, utter poverty and massive numbers made this group of immigrants such a perceived threat to the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant hierarchy of the United States in the mid 19th century. They had to prove themselves worthy of the American racial state and we'll return to this shortly. Douglas couldn't help but notice the difference between the Irish in Ireland and those in America. And he spoke about it on several occasions. In this uh, 1953 speech, for example, uh, he declared, the Irish people warm hearted and generous and sympathizing with the oppressed people everywhere. When they stand upon their own green isle are instantly taught on arriving in this Christian country to hate and despise colored people. They are taught to believe that we eat the bread which of right belongs to them. The cruel lie is told the Irish that our adversity is essential to their prosperity. You know, in his narrative, Doug Douglas did recall meetings. Yeah, you know, he met, for example, the two sympathetic Irishmen during his time in the slave, uh, as a slave in a, in a Baltimore shipyard. But for the most part, his encounters with Irish America Irish Americans were dreadful. Citizenship is a legal term, while nationality is a cultural one. So when considering this difference, the transatlantic Douglas and the transatlantic famine Irish present us with an illuminating mirror image of each other. Uh, while it is beyond the power of the Irish or the British to bestow, you know, American citizenship upon Douglas, they could in fact uh, bestow upon him American nationality, at least while he was on their, their shores, where he's considered third, thoroughly American, culturally speaking. On the other hand, the famine Irish were bestowed US citizenship in America, but denied US nationality, at least initially. Uh, so let me sketch how the famine Irish acquired each of these in the US at the expense of non-white uh, people like Douglas. With regard to citizenship, the Irish were aided greatly by American laws, starting with the US's first immigration law of 1790, which decreed uh, citizenship open to quote, unquote, any free white person. American citizenship was white citizenship and as European, Europeans, the Irish qualified. But this qualification for white, uh, but their qualification for white nationality was a different matter. As noted earlier, they had to prove their suitability for that. Governmental and political structures such as the police, civil service, and the Democratic Party, deeply racist apparatuses, and 
uh, became vehicles to advance the status of Irish Catholics and help them gain US nationality, that is white nationality over time. Thus in a period when racial oppression laid at America's cornerstone, these Irish both embraced and helped build the American racial state. So my time is uh, almost up and I'd like to turn to my fourth and final uh, section real quickly. First, reminding us of a, a few General Neal's observation that we cannot possibly understand our present or shape our future without acknowledging our past, the good, the bad, and the ugly. American white nationalist suspicion of Irish American Catholics ebbed and flowed throughout American history and varied from uh, region to region. And I certainly don't have the time to detail it here. However, I would say that with the rise of the US civil rights movement in the 1960s, led by the inheritors of Frederick Douglass's activist tradition. Any remaining barriers to Irish Catholic entry into American nationalist, uh, right, uh, white nationalist ranks began to dissolve. Things like the Boston uh, anti-busing movement helped in that regard. And later on, so too did uh, the Reagan years and the transformation of uh, the Republican Party and its you know, infamous Southern strategy. Where once the Democratic Party was uh, the one more aligned with white nationalism, today it's the Republican Party. The number of Irish names among the leadership of the recent Trump administration and, and today's Rep Republican Party leadership in general is staggering and something I think unthinkable 50 or 60 years ago. But I would hasten to add, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, Irish names populate anti-racist movement leadership too, and including in today's more diverse uh, Democratic Party. Furthermore, I, I would say that, you know, uh, events such as this one uh, would help counteract destructive white nationalist propaganda on both sides of the Atlantic. So on that positive note, I would end here by thanking Adrian again, our technical support, Tim and Emma, and the organizers of Douglas Week and everyone here for listening. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Peter. Lots to think about there. And um, also, we've got some, some good questions coming in. You mentioned one of them. We'll make sure we come back to that one. We've got American literature here um, at the close of our symposium today. Rolling on here, super quick. Our final, last but not least, uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Paul Giles from the University of Sydney. Um, Dr. Giles is um, a professor um, in Australia. Amongst his many publications are Douglas's Black Atlantic, Britain, Europe, Egypt, um, in the Cambridge Companion to Frederick Douglass and Narrative Reversals and Power Exchanges, Frederick Douglass and British Culture. So Dr. Giles, many publications, lots of, of wonderful stuff on, on Frederick Douglass. Um, subject of his talk today is on Frederick Douglass and the Irish Australian uh, diaspora. Um, so without further ado here, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Giles um, to close things up. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Adrian, and, and thanks for organizing this uh, symposium. I hope you can uh, hear me okay. I haven't got the, uh, the background, the right background, but here I am at uh, five o'clock in the morning in, in Sydney. So um, what I want to do in this brief talk is to suggest that there's been too much focus on the whole on early Douglas rather than um, late Douglas. Um, that his early work was linked to a kind of spirit of emancipation and of course the rhetoric of transcendentalism in the 1840s. And the, the obvious key work for that is the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass in 1845. But what I want to suggest is that this can be counterpointed with the greater sort of worldly complexity of the life and times of Frederick Douglass, uh, published in 1881, which is a longer work, uh, less easy for students to negotiate, but is, I think, um, equally interesting in terms of the sort of politics and the general view of the world that Douglass had. Similarly, I, I'd su suggest, um, uh, although, of course, I haven't heard all of the, the papers here, they came too early for me, but I'd suggest that perhaps there's been rather too much emphasis on Douglas's relations with Daniel O'Connell and their meeting in 1845, Douglas's tour of Ireland, 
and the fact that William Lloyd Garrison took over the title of the liberator from O'Connell. And of course, that has been reinforced by tributes to O'Connell and uh, Douglas from Obama fairly recently. Um, what I want to suggest, though, is the fact that um, Douglas didn't die until 1895 uh, is interesting, and his kind of later period uh, is what I want to focus on here, and particularly his uh, friendship with John Boyle O'Reilly. And now I'm going to try to get the uh, screen sharing working here. Um, I think, does that work? Um, Good, yep, I can see it. Um, can, you can go to like a, um, you can go to your slideshow if you want, and that, you know, yeah. like full, full screen, if that will that'd be good. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so that, so um, O'Reilly, that's, this is uh, John Boyle O'Reilly. Now, now Douglas had a friendship in the 1880s with, with John Boyle O'Reilly, who was born in Ireland in 1844, joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood in 1865, and was then arrested and transported to Western Australia on the last convict ship in 1867. O'Reilly had actually rather an interesting time in Western Australia. He liked the environment and the scenery, and he fell in love with the daughter of his jailer. So it was all a big experience for him. Well, in 1869, he escaped from Australia on board the American whaling ship, the Gazelle, uh, it was a grinning escapade. Um, they went via Liverpool. He managed to avoid capture and arrived in Philadelphia in November 1869. And this was the two song Van Diemen's Land. So it became a sort of source of celebration. Anyway, once in America, O'Reilly moved to Boston and became well known among the Irish. And 